So we're going to to wait some minutes for for people to to join in, even if it means that we're a couple of minutes uh, delayed today. So uh, my name is is Clarice. I'm one of uh, the organizers of the school. I would like the the, the other organizers of the school to, to introduce themselves, the ones who are here. Hi, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> yes, good morning and good evening, everyone. So my name is uh, Abastad, and I am a postdoc at the uh, Quan Qubit Lab at UCLA. So uh, we are happy to have you all uh, here. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, I'm Nathan. I'm Nathan Babcock, and I'm with the Quantum Biology Lab at Howard University. It's uh, my pleasure to be at uh, my first, I think, the first quantum biology summer school. Spring, spring, or winter, oh, or whatever. Pardon. Yeah, we're all in the same season. It's still spring. <laughs> no, it's still, it's still, it's still winter, right? I, uh, I, it's become spring in Pennsylvania. I apologize. Yeah, and I guess I'm the last one who's here at least, and I'm Alessandro, I'm a postdoc in Clarice's lab, Qubit lab at UCLA as well, and it's a pleasure to be organizing this, hopefully you'll be able to enjoy it. Okay, so here's how this is going to go, right? Um, every day um, at 10.30, at to 11.30 uh, PST, uh, you are going to um, be put into breakout rooms where uh, you're going to be able to discuss with the help of the moderators uh, some questions that uh, were the subject of that, that day's lectures, right? So every day, 10.30 to 11.30, um yeah and and that's going to be very special we hope uh from tomorrow to friday the days are going to be divided into three different lectures one hour per lecture the days are divided by themes today is a little bit of a special day because uh we have uh what we're calling boot camps right we're going to have a uh small boot camp for quantum mechanics as in a small boot camp for biology whatever that means uh, one of the, the challenges and the cool things about doing uh, working on um, on a field that is at the edge uh, at the interface of different subjects uh, is the fact that nobody knows uh, everything we're all learning so we all need to learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So today is really designed to uh, give the opportunity for people who have not been exposed to quantum mechanics to learn a little bit, and uh, for people who have not been exposed to biology to learn a little bit. So um, moreover, uh, and and please moderators, as, as soon as the other moderators arrive, please, uh, inform them of what we're doing, make them co-hosts. And the idea is that um, you're going to have plenty of time to uh, ask questions and discuss during the breakout rooms at the last hour. Um, so um, we are going to try to make the lectures without questions, like without uh, people asking questions uh, by voice. But please, if you have questions, put your questions in the chat and our wonderful moderators will help uh, answer these questions uh, if they can. Hopefully they, they will be able to, 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 so, to, to, to answer your questions by the chat. Cool. Anything else, moderators, that I've forgotten? Okay. All seems to be set. Cool, I was out. While we wait a little bit more, do you do you want to share a little bit about the statistics that you compiled? Just just verbally, uh, the statistics yes. that you compiled about the summer school, this winter, whatever, spring school. So yeah, so uh, 
uh, we have some uh, interesting uh, statistics. So uh, first of all, gen uh, gender wise is almost like uh, female is like 45% and the rest is male. Uh, and also some like, because I use like machine learning for this. So some I couldn't uh, recognize for that. And from countries, like there are a lot of people registered with Gmail. So we don't know yet like uh, where they are from. But USA, for example, 17%, and then it is UK, 10%, and India, Brazil, uh, Czech, and so on. So the, this is just distribution of uh, people attending uh, this, this uh, school. Uh, yeah, we are looking forward uh, to have really uh, interesting discussions. And uh, those um, uh, talks are going to be recorded and uh, put uh, into our uh, lab groups channel. We're going to send out this information and also the slides, uh, if the, the speaker uh, consents, are going to be put into our um, website. Okay. And, and how many total registrants did we have? Over 200? Oh, yeah. Uh, by now it's 220. Yeah. Exciting. So without further ado, I am going to start my question. And can you confirm that you can hear me? You can see the slides, the slides change. Awesome. Yes. OK. So welcome, everyone. Uh, we hope you're, you're in for a treat. Uh, we hope you have fun. We hope you learn. Right. So uh, the very first thing that uh, we're going to start with is a boot camp is an introduction to uh, quantum mechanics. So uh, again, my name is Clarissa Yellow. My pronouns are she, her, and I like to call myself a quantum engineer. So this means that I and my lab and we build instruments to study and control things that are so small and so well protected from their environment that they're better described by the laws of quantum mechanics, as opposed to the laws of classical mechanics that rule everything around us. Uh, but the very first point that I would like to make is that uh, quantum mechanics is not something that only happens in a lab. Quantum mechanics is already part of your daily life. For example, your computers, your classical computers only work because of quantum mechanics, because they have transistors, which are devices that depend on quantum mechanics, uh, LEDs, lasers, laser pointers, uh, optical fibers. Those things only work because of quantum mechanics. If you go to the hospital, and you can see my pointer. Can you confirm that you can see my pointer? Okay. If you go to the hospital in this weird machine called a magnetic resonance imager. Uh, you can get a diagnostics because of quantum mechanics. You can build very big microscopes called uh, electron microscopes and take pictures of this little beast here because of quantum mechanics. And hopefully at some point we will make the transition because there is evidence that strongly suggests that even nature is using quantum mechanics to function. And one uh, very important point that I, that I want to make is that I believe that quantum literacy should be, uh, should be more widespread. Uh, I think quantum literacy is essential for you to understand the world that you already live in. It's not some something futuristic or anything. Our world is already powered by quantum mechanics in very relevant ways. So I would like to, to start the, the story of quantum mechanics. Uh, I, I'm going to, to go through a series of concepts that are going to, to be building up a little bit on top of each other. And let me tell you a little bit uh, of a story of how quantum mechanics started uh, at all, right? It started um, when something called quantization of energy was proposed. So it all started with something that, that is, is not super interesting, but it started with thermodynamics going wrong, okay? So it turns out that in the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, thermodynamics like the study of heat, temperature, that was like, that, that was the, the frontier thing, right? And people were doing a lot of experiments, a lot of modeling in this field. And it turns out that everything that has a 
temperature that is higher than the absolute zero. In other words, everything in the known universe uh, that has, which has a temperature that is higher than zero uh, Kelvin vibrates. Temperature is sort of equivalent to vibration. Okay, so for example, everything sort of vibrates, but I'll give you one example here, like the atoms of this heating coil here that you may use to cook your food, or like the a, a lamp filament that that uh, sort of glows when you turn on the lamp. Everything is vibrate, and it turns out that uh, charges that vibrate emit light, like the light here that you're seeing here, the light of like a filament of of a lamp, right? And uh, the atoms that compose those objects, uh, they have charges, and charges that vibrate emit light. And people were trying to model this. So uh, one of the first attempts of people was to model uh, the atoms into those uh, those objects here for example a heating coil lamp filament uh, people were trying to model those atoms as little springs right that you can see here and that you've probably seen in high school atoms that really like do this and uh, they, they were trying to model this light like the the, the characteristics of those objects if their atoms were composed of, of, of little springs that that sort of vibrate. Okay. Uh, and it turns out that if you do this, like if you if you just take a collection of springs and 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 tell them, well, uh, this really looks like what's happening, say, in the wall of uh, an object, right, that is at a certain temperature. The problem is that the theory that comes out disagree with experiments and in particular it predicts very very bad results so bad that there's a name that people call it it predicts a ultraviolet catastrophe ultraviolet catastrophe means that there's too much light too much light emitted by the vibrating charges by the vibrating atoms at very large frequencies of light so there was a problem that had no theoretical solution, no agreement with the experiment, and people were trying to solve this problem. Then comes a guy uh, called Planck, and Planck was just trying to save this model. He was just trying to make this theory agree with experiments on like the, the, the type of light emitted by uh, objects that are so hot that their atoms uh, can be modeled as little springs. And um, what Planck proposed at that point without any uh, a priori reasoning. Okay, he, he he wanted a fix for this theory. So here's what he proposed. He proposed that the atoms in such hot bodies could yes be uh, described as springs, just like you see here, but in this plot here. What I plot, and you might remember this sort of plot from high school, I plot here the potential energy of, say, the, the particle, for example, this mass hooked up to a spring, as a function of the position where this mass is. For uh, a classical particle or a classical mass hooked up to a string, this mass can have all the potential energies in this curve. It can explore all the points here. It, it, an analogy would be like you have a ball, right? And you, you put it in a hole in the ground that has this shape, and this ball can explore all the potential energies of this hole. What Planck comes and say is that, well, for some reason that I don't yet understand, this model is not right. But uh, if I change slightly this model, I fix the theory. And here's what Planck proposed. Planck proposed that if the atoms were indeed modeled by those masses into springs, but if those masses in springs could have only specific energies, which would mean that, for example, the atom, it cannot explore all this landscape, but only maybe some 
discrete points in this landscape. If you did this, if atoms can only have specific energies and thus, for reasons that you still don't understand, I'm going to, to, to tell you a little bit later, and thus emit light at only specific energies, if you put this fix in the theory, actually the theory starts agreeing with the experiment. So the quick fix, in other words, that Planck found out was the following. So um, assume that the amount of light emitted by those moving charges, assume that it cannot be arbitrary, but only integer multiples of the smallest unit of energy, also known as quantum of energy. Quantum and quantization uh, means discretization, mean, means that something cannot explore all the available values, but can explore only certain discrete values. Here, for example, Plant uh, posited that the light emitted by those vibrating atoms could not exist in arbitrary quantities, but only as integer multiples of this minimum amount of energy, this energy, E, okay, that was proportional to the frequency of light that was emitted by those moving charges by a proportionality constant that he needed to create, that he needed to introduce. This proportionality constant is called Planck's constant nowadays. Note that it, it has a very tiny value. It has units of energy times time, okay? And again, this was a complete arbitrary uh, thing that needed to be introduced that fixed the theory, okay? And um, I, I just want to, to remind you that quantization or discretization is not something that is th that should be very foreign to you. For example, uh, money uh, exists as multiples of a penny. For example, in the U.S., every every dollar amount can be put can be written as a multiple of of like the same amount in pennies, which is the smallest unit of money in the US, um, scales in like a piano, for example, the notes, they, 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 uh, the adjusted notes, they usually ch change by a half tone, right? So uh, basically the, 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 the notes also exist in discrete quantities. And for example, a escalator also exists as a function of, of it, multiples of an integer number of squares. So this is not a surprising a feature of nature. It's just surprising because it seems to underlie uh, very fundamental properties of matter. So um, this is like historically what's going on. But there's another thing that I would like to mention, which is the fact that um, I find the coolest thing, the fact that um, this quantization of energy also saved the atom in a way that I'm going to explain to you. I think it's it's even more interesting than the thermodynamics problem that it just gave a quick fix for. At the beginning of the 20th century, I'm going to, 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 to see, let, let's see if you agree with me. I'm going to posit that the atom, the concept of atom was in great, great danger. So there is a very famous, uh, person who, who developed the theory for, uh, for light interactions called Maxwell. You have, might have heard about Maxwell equations. Maxwell, Maxwell discovered that charges that go into a circular orbit, right, they emit light, thereby losing energy. This was known from the classical theories of electromagnetism. At the same time, this other guy called Rutherford had proposed a model for the atom. And he had said, atoms are composed of electrons, which are particles with negative charge that orbit around a nucleus that has positive charge, as in this model that you see there. I hope you agree with me that those two things are a little bit dangerous for the atom, because if the atom is composed of negatively charged particles that orbit, right? Well, according to Maxwell, charges going in a circular orbit, they emit light, 
and thereby they lose energy. The idea being that should an atom be really like this, as Rutherford uh, posited, the idea is that the electrons are going to emit light, losing energy, and they would maybe spiral uh, into the nucleus and the atom would not be, uh, it would not be stable at all. So that's really weird because Maxwell and Rutherford could not be right at the same time, or could they? Uh, in classical physics, they could not, but in quantum physics, they could, because Planck is going to save the, again, the day again. The same concept that we just saw of quantization of energy is also going to apply to the atom. The, this concept says that quantum objects can only occupy discrete energy levels, right? You cannot uh, explore the whole surface of potential energy states, but only very particular energy states. So using this, let us see if uh, how I think Planck saves the atom, because Bohr could actually uh, write a slightly better model for the atom. So the idea is that uh, using this quantization of energy concept, Bohr proposed that electrons orbiting the, the, nuclear, the nucleus of an atom could only like explore B in discrete energy states, which, mean that, which means that they can only be in very specific little orbits here that, that are those like uh, circles. This is also like not really how it happens in real life, but that's a, 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 a very uh, interesting picture for us now. So um, the idea then is that the electrons can only occupy those uh, very specific discrete energy levels of discrete orbits. And importantly, something that also comes from Planck's uh, hypothesis is that the minimum orbit energy is not zero. Okay, we're going to see a little bit more in detail that, but the idea is that whereas a classical particle can be in any energy state in this, in this sort of curve, including the very bottom of the energy states, a quantum object can never have like this minimum of energy state here. So that the minimum orbit energy for an electron around a nucleus is not zero, so that the electron cannot really spiral into a nucleus, right? So basically the atom is saved. And now uh, a, a little bit, Bringing back what I mentioned before, the idea is that the electron lives in those uh, different discrete orbits here. And uh, Bohr found out that you can actually, uh, the electron can actually jump between those discrete orbits by either absorbing energy or emitting energy. Uh, which is uh, energy in the form of light, right? But because those orbits uh, have very a very precise difference in energy with it with respect to each other, only specific light energies can be absorbed or emitted. Again, it's the quantization of energy that that, that sort of comes come comes in handy here, and this sort of theory predicted. Uh, features such as like the type of light that you get uh, that, that is absorbed or emitted by different atoms. This is a very, uh, a theory that is super uh, well proven today. Um, and it all comes from Planck's uh, very nice insight. Okay. So at around the same time where people, where Planck was starting to, um, to, 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 to talk about quantization of energy. There were other people, one of which is Einstein, uh, other people working on similar concepts that gave rise to what is today known as wave particle duality. Wave particle duality uh, means that at the same time, light waves or beams of light are composed of particles and at the same time, uh, 
tiny massive objects can be seen as waves. This is what is known as wave particle duality. So in particular, let us see like what we mean and what Einstein discovered, uh, which is that light waves or like a beam of light can be thought as a composed of quanta of light of tiny particles. So there was an experimental result uh, that people were trying to explain that was dubbed the photoelectric effect. Here's what it meant. You have a, you, people had in their labs a foil of like metal, okay, for example, gold. And then they shone different types of light onto this metal foil. And then they analyzed whether there were electrons emitted uh, by this foil while you were shining the light. And here are some of the experimental results. For example, for a given metal in this, in this picture here, if you shown a red beam of light, there were no electrons emitted, right? In contrast, if you, if you shown green or blue beams of light, there were electrons emitted, for example. And uh, maybe you remember from high school, but the difference between the colors of light is, of course, the wavelength or correspondingly the frequency, right? So um, the first thing that people saw experimentally was like some colors of light really don't kick out electrons, even if the beam is very strong. For example, you can put a, a ginormous beam of red light and there are no electrons kicked out at all. The other thing that people saw was the number of electrons that are kicked out, if any, depends on the beam strength, like how, how many electrons are kicked out. And finally, the energy of the electrons flying out does not change if the light beam is weak or strong, but depends only on the light color. For example, here for this blue beam of light, the electrons that come out are much more energetic. And Einstein realized that all these observations could be uh, sort of reconciled if we thought about light waves as being composed of tiny little particles of light that to some extent behave uh, in some instances like really like tiny billiard balls. For example, the idea is that in this metal foil, there are electrons. And if there are tiny little collisions, those electrons might have uh, enough energy to get out, to, to be expelled from the materials. For example, in this example for the red uh, beam of light, maybe the, the tiny little marbles of light, they really don't have a lot of energy so that they cannot really push any electron out. The number of the electrons being kicked out depending on the beam strength, it would be because there are just more of those tiny little particles. And the energy of the electrons flying out, not changing according to the beam strength, but only to the light color, means that different light colors have different tiny particles with tiny little energies like tiny billiard balls so that the extra energy depends on this individual energy of those uh, particles of light. Einstein called those quanta of light photons. Okay, And again, uh, in something that is very familiar now, um, each photon can be thought of being a tiny little energy package of quantized energy. Remember, this is Planck's constant. And uh, for light or for, for waves in particular, the, the speed is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. For light, C is the speed of light. There's this relationship. And uh, according to relativity, the momentum, if you remember momentum from high school, momentum for a particle with mass is mass times velocity. Momentum is like the, the kick that uh, a particle or billiard ball can impact. Uh, but uh, photons do not have mass. 
So uh, from relativity, the momentum of a massless particle is its energy divided by the speed of light. So that if you put all those formulas together, you uh, find out, I promise you, that uh, you get to the fact that a photon, right, a quantum of light carries a tiny little momentum as if it really were a tiny uh, billiard ball. And this photon carries uh, a momentum that is given by, uh, it's, it's a quantized momentum because it depends on this h in this Planck's constant divided by uh, the wavelength of the photon. And note that this is very, very small. H is very, very small, but nevertheless, it's still useful. For example, solar sails. Solar sails uh, already, I think, I believe they exist to some extent. Well, I'm pretty sure that they exist. So basically, solar sails are um, materials that you can put uh, into space, and they they sail, they uh, they, they move because of this radiation pressure uh, given by photons, for example, from, from the sun. So they move because of this momentum, because of the, this hitting that light from the sun imparts on those sails. And there are other very cool things. You can, it turns out that you can use lasers, you can use light to actually trap massive particles. Uh, for example, this is called like, for example, uh, optical tweezers, tweezers because you can grab particles and they work because the photon carries a momentum because the photon can actually impart a kick onto matter. And if you take advantage of that, you can actually trap particles with that. Okay. So this is one side of the wave particle. Duality. The other part is the fact that tiny particles uh, of mass with mass different from zero can behave as waves. Okay, and this is a little bit more exotic. So let us see uh, if if we already know a little bit of what I mean by that. So uh, let's start with this picture from the right. Maybe you remember that. Uh, uh, light and maybe water, uh, like water waves in a pond, that uh, waves can uh, interfere, right? So for example, and, and like interference is like those, those little fringes of like changing intensity. Have a look at this picture here. So here's what you're looking at. You're looking at the top view of a say light wave or a water wave okay that goes from the left to the right and it's made to go through two little slits here okay so there is a, a wave going through the wave can go through those two slits um, if this happens what you have is that the 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 wave that goes through those two slits. Basically, uh, one way of understanding this is that the, the, the waves go through both slits sort of at the same time, the, the wave interfere, so that if you look at a screen to see where like the, the wave is, is hitting at, at like a second screen after those two uh, slits, and now you flip this by 90 degrees, you see something like this. You see an alternating pattern of places where the wave hit and places where it didn't hit. Okay, so you see an alternation uh, of, uh, of, of, of like, you know, intensity of where the wave hit. And this is a feature that is usually referred to as interference of waves. Waves interfere, okay? Uh, and this interference is caused by this, th the fact that the wave uh, actually goes through uh, two slits, if you will, at the same time. Okay, so this is what happens if you do this experiment with a light wave or a water wave. However, if you do the same experiment with a cannonball, I assure you that what you're going to see, so you throw a lot of cannonballs onto this, this wall with two slits, okay? 
I assure you that if you want to see where the cannonballs are hitting in the second slit, you're going to mostly see that the cannonballs concentrate either in a position that is directly across one slit or directly across the other slit. Okay, There is no interference there. They're just like big cannonballs being, being shot at a place with two slits. And of course, the balls will go through uh, close to those slits. However, this seems intuitive, right? Except for the fact that I assure you that if you do the same experiment with electrons, you don't see the cannonball picture, but you see what you would see with a light wave or with a water wave, which is very funky. So it turns out that uh, this is the reflection of the world that you live in, which in, in which it seems that a single tiny massive particle can interfere with itself and really behave like a wave under nanoscopic conditions. So then there was this, in order to explain why that was happening, there was this, this dude called De Broly, who actually handed in the shortest PhD thesis ever, which was just a couple of, of pages long, and which was essentially this argument. Well, we've just seen from wave particle duality that a photon had a momentum that was quantized, right, given by age divided by the wavelength. So why wouldn't the same be valid for massive particles? And then he just put some equations together, and then he was like, well, the momentum the, the kick imparted by a massive particle uh, is the mass times the velocity. Right? So just putting those two formulas together, he found out, which afterwards was shown to, to be correct, that to each massive particle, there is an associated quantized wavelength. A okay? wavelength that is also quantized, it also depends on the, the Planck's constant. And this, again, because it depends on age, it, it's also very, very small. So the kick here is that cannonballs have wavelengths that are extremely, extremely small, so that it doesn't really matter for practical applications. However, uh, electrons, for example, they have a tiny wavelengths, wavelengths that are very, very big compared to the wavelengths of cannonballs. So actually, under some circumstances, it's actually we can actually explore, for example, for electrons, the fact that they have an associated wavelength. For example, electron microscopes work um, in the same way that an optical microscope works. So for an optical microscope, you shine light to look at something. In an electron microscope, you shine electrons. And this works because electrons have an associated wavelength that is tiny, but that can be useful, that is not so tiny so that it, it, it loses all interest, for example, the wavelength of a cannonball, but it's small and it can also be used to do things in practice. Okay, so it's something that is uh, very useful nowadays. And um, this type of, of like the fact that tiny particles uh, with mass behaves as waves is still explored today in research. There is a group from uh, Vienna uh, and basically they can make uh, things with up to like a couple thousand of atoms interfere with itself. So it's very beautiful type of experiments. Larger and larger things are made to, to interfere with itself, are made to display their full wave character at the same time that they have a particle character. So uh, it turns out, for reasons that I won't explain too much, that both matter and photons can be described in quantum mechanics by a mathematical beast called a wave function. So we're going to start uh, with the most, uh, I assure you, it's, it's like the, the, the hardcore part of this talk, okay. uh, I assure you that after this mathematical part, we're going to, to come back to, to nicer things, but now I really need you to pay attention because this is going to be the foundation to what you're going to hear throughout this 
weak. So I'm affirming that the mathematical object to describe matter and photons in quantum mechanics is a mathematical beast called wave functions. Okay. So what's a wave function? And the wave function is just a function with a weird notation. So here you see a lot of functions. So y is a function of x, okay? And y can be, be different functions of x, right? Y can, can represent different things. For example, maybe this curve could represent uh, the cost of chocolate as a function of demand. Maybe this function function could be temperature as a function of year, time of the year, or time of the month, or something. Those are just functions, and a wave function is also a function with benefits. A wave function, uh, again, sorry, it's it's very it's very abstract. I hope I it's going to start to be less abstract in a moment. A wave function is a function to describe how the state of a quantum system depends, for example, on the position of this quantum system, on time. And wave functions, and you're going to see this sometimes, in, a, in, in I am sure, in the, uh, in the talks this week, a wave function is denoted by this weird symbol here, this vertical bar and this bracket here. Okay, And this notation is called a ket. So a wave function could be could be like this cat a. I don't expect this to mean anything. I just want you to know that this is red cat a. Like regular functions in real life, a wave function can be added, giving like wave functions can be added, giving another wave function. Uh, a plus B, wave, fun wave function A plus wave function B is this, the exact as wave function B plus wave function A. There's always, uh, each wave function has its own minus version so that when you add those two, you get a vector zero, right? And wave functions uh, can also have, also have the property that when you multiply this wave function by, uh, by a uh, real number, you get like another wave function. And actually, regular functions are not the only thing that obeys those things. Uh, if you go back to high school, uh, vectors also obey those things. And, and uh, my point here is that wave functions, uh, we're not going to go into super detail, but they are also types of vectors. And a wave function, unlike regular functions and regular vectors in real life, uh, they obey something that is sort of funky. They also obey that if you multiply them by a real number, you get another wave function, but they also obey that if you multiply them by a complex number, you also get another wave function. So a complex number is just a abstract representation it's like complex numbers are helpers are mathematical helpers okay uh, you might remember from high school that you can everything that 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 we live around we live in a world of real numbers complex numbers don't exist in real life we cannot measure a real uh, a complex number Okay, so it turns out that you can, you, if you have here the, 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 the line of the real numbers, if you give an extra dimension to that line, this extra dimension is the dimension of the imaginary numbers. And then from a line, you, def you have now a plane and a number in this plane is called a complex number, which is a combination of a real number plus another real number called here y multiplied by the imaginary number called i. And i is defined as being the thing that if you square it, you get minus one. Yeah, it's funky, right? And um, all real number, uh, all complex numbers z, they have an associated complex conjugate denoted z bar or sometimes red star. 
and for this complex uh, number, uh, complex conjugate z bar here, basically you flip the complex conjugate part. So wherever had whatever had a plus i sign now has a minus i sign. And um, if you square the absolute value of this complex number, which is given mathematically by multiplying the complex conjugate by itself, you get basically the magnitude square of this vector, and this is a real number. The fact that wave functions obey this, this, this fact that by, by multiplying a wave function by a complex number, you get another wave function, means that the wave function lives in the space of complex number. It's complex valued. Okay. And uh, why that is, it's, it's, uh, I'll explain when we talk about the evolution equation. But to cut the long story short, this is the representation that works. Why that is, nobody knows, but this is the representation that works. So a wave function lives in the space of complex numbers. A wave function can have different dimensions. For example, it can have one dimension, it can be like a, a function of x, right? That, that, that is a complex function, if you will. A wave function can, can, for example, have two dimensions that are denoted by, by like a column matrix uh, with indices A1 and A2, where A1 and A2 are complex functions it's that they themselves you can have a, a wave function being composed of five uh, different elements each one being a complex function uh, right so depending on the problem you can have wave functions represented by different dimensions and uh, a wave function has a complex conjugate wave function okay the complex conjugate of cat a is is the mirror image of cat A, which is usually called a bra, bra A. Okay. So, for example, if those here are to the left are the wave function, their complex conjugate is plotted, is, is written to the right. For example, uh, the bra, if the wave function is A of x, if you complex conjugate this function, this 1D function, you have the bra for a cat that is a two component wave function. The bra is given by, uh, we obtain the bra if uh, we do an operation with this matrix. We transpose it from a line matrix, we make it a column matrix, and we uh, complex conjugate the individual elements. And the same thing for this longer five dimensional wave function here. Okay. And similar properties are valid for the complex conjugate wave function. But importantly, if the, the equivalent of us multiplying the wave function, the catch A by a complex conjugate, uh, by a, um, a complex number Z, if we want to do the same for the complex conjugate wave function, we actually need to multiply the bra by the complex conjugate of z. Okay, just again, all of this is super, super. <laughs> this is very, uh, this is very abstract. I know, but the important part is that a wave function and a complex conjugate can combine. Okay, and they combine. Surprise, to surprise, and that's where they're, they're called those names, to form a bracket. So this is read as a bracket because this guy here is a bra and this other guy here is a cat. So um, a wave function and a complex conjugate, they combine uh, forming a bracket. And this bracket operation is similar to what's known in real life as a dot product. A dot product in real life is depicted here. Okay, you have two vectors, and the dot product between vector A and vector B is given by the magnitude 
of vector A times the magnitude of vector B times the, the cos of the angle in between them. And the dot product means how aligned those two vectors are. Okay, so if they are one on top of each other, the dot product is maximal. If they are at 90 degrees with respect to each other, we also say there is no overlap. The vectors are orthogonal so that uh, the, dot, the dot product is zero. A dot product, uh, a bracket in, in quantum mechanics for the wave functions, is defined then like this. If you just write the, the matrices, you have this. Oh, and, and another thing, in real life, the dot product is a number. Okay, you, the dot product between those two vectors is a number. And here in quantum mechanics for wave functions, it's the same, regardless of the dimensionality of the wave vectors, wave functions involved, this dot product, this bracket is a number, except that it's a complex number. It's not a real number. Okay, so from two vectors, you make a number. Differently from uh, real life, though, where the dot product between A and B is exactly the same as the dot product between B and A. In quantum mechanics, the bracket B A is different from the bracket A and B. And it turns out that you can prove that they're complex conjugates with each other. They're the, the, the complex number that they result, they differ because one is like plus I something and the other one is minus I the same something. And again, uh, uh, just a nomenclature, uh, if the magnitude of this dot product, uh, this bracket for a particular vector with itself is one, this means that this wave function is normalized, this is usually used, and if the bracket, the quantum mechanical bracket between two vectors is zero, a, the, the, the two vectors are said to be orthogonal, as you would have in real life. But again, the important part is that a wave function and a complex conjugate can combine to give quantities that can be measured in real life. And that's probably the most important thing in this part of the talk, because real numbers, they're a good mathematical tool. Real numbers do not exist in real life. You cannot measure a, a, a complex number. Complex numbers do not exist in real life life at all. They are mathematical helpers. Okay, So the idea is that if we want to measure something having to do with the wave functions, we better find real quantities associated with that. And whereas the bracket is, in general, a complex number, okay, if we square this, if we get the magnitude squared of this complex number, as said before, we get like the magnitude squared, the size of this complex uh, number, okay? And this is a real number. So whereas we cannot have access to a cat alone, a bra alone, we can have access to this thing, which is the magnitude squared of a bracket. And that is a real number. So never forget that wave functions cannot be measured or observed in real life since they're complex. Wave functions, like complex numbers are just mathematical helpers. But in contrast, we can measure real quantities like a bracket of a wave function with itself or a bracket say between B and A or squared, right? Um, again, if same thing as I wrote in the last slide, if the magnitude squared of this bracket between the same wave function and its complex conjugate a a is equal to one the wave function is said to be normalized this is usually used and the final important part that i would like to mention is the fact that this quantity here in a way that i'm going to give you one example and another one later on this quantity the absolute value squared of a bracket between b and a for example, is to be understood as the probability that the quantum object or the wave function A, or like the, the object described by the wave function A, 
is in a quantum state B. So usually you read this from the right to left, is the probability that the quantum object represented by this wave function A is actually found in a quantum state B. Here's what I mean. This is, again, very mathematical. It's going to get physical in, in, in one second. But for example, imagine that a quantum object A is described as a combination of quantum object B and quantum object C. And this combination can have like real values, imaginary values. Note that if you do this, you actually, I mean, if you, if you, if you get the magnitude, uh, if B and C are normalized and orthogonal among themselves, okay, you will find that this is true, that A is normalized. So let's calculate this bracket between B and A, which doesn't have any physical meaning right now in real life. But we can we can do this. So here's your your bra B, and then you just replace your cat A with its definition. B bracket B and B uh, for B normalized is one. Bracket B and C for B orthogonal to C is zero. So the second term is zero. The second term is square root of zero three zero point three times one. So you have zero point Three. Now, if you take the absolute value of this bracket B A squared, which is just this guy here, you have 0 0.3. Similarly, if you take the absolute value of the bracket C A squared, you get 0 0.7. This means that the object described by the wave function A has a 30% probability of being found in quantum state B and a 70% probability of being found in quantum state C. Okay, And right now, this is very mathematical. But uh, this combination here, this A represented as a combination, is going to be referred to as A being in a superposition. But right now, it's just a combination of vectors, if you will, vectors that live in a complex space. So all of this is good. Okay, uh, But let me tell you a little bit how we went there, how we started there. So uh, it's, it, I mean, Basically, uh, people at this point, they were trying to find out equation, an, an equation that waves of matter would obey. Like different waves have different mathematical equations. You can, you can think about a sound wave produced by a guitar, a, 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 a water wave, a light wave. And it turns out that nanoscopically, light waves uh, obey that thing that we call the Maxwell equations. But people were trying to find out uh, what type of wave equation was obeyed by matter waves. And people started proposing a lot of, a lot of things. And then there was uh, this guy uh, called Schrodinger that came up with something that is usually called Schrodinger equation. Well, Schrodinger was a bad, bad guy. So I will call his equation, the evolution equation throughout. And his equation was basically the best educated guess ever. So people tried different wave equations that, uh, that were obeyed by matter. And it turns out that the wave equation that predicted results that people were seeing experimentally had this following form. So it was an educated guess that, that actually worked and works still. So here's what the evolution equation says. It says that a wave function representing a massive particle, such as an electron, it needs to obey this equation. It says that those d's, they, they're, they, they're called derivatives. If you have never seen them, you can think of it like as, as delta, for example, uh, in high school, you might remember that 
a displacement delta x, uh, uh, sorry, a, a speed like the, the a speed v, a velocity v, could be given by a displacement delta x divided by a interval in time delta t. Okay, so this is more or less like this, except that there, there's like it, it's it, this shows how this uh, wave function changes as a function of the position x twice. Okay, this is what this means. There, there's like two deltas involved, if you will. It doesn't matter. So this means that how the wave function changes as a function of position plus the wave function multiplied by the potential energy seen by the particle is equal to the total energy of the particle times the wave function. So usually people don't call, historically, people refer to wave functions not as A or B, but usually as Psi. So here's, it's the same thing written instead of with bra A, I'm writing, sorry, cat A, I'm writing cat Psi. Psi is a complex function. Okay, This describes, say, a tiny massive object with mass M, such as an electron. So V, again, is the potential energy of this massive object. Remember, for a uh, spring, the potential energy was given by that parabola that we saw in the beginning. E is the total energy. And again, Psi really doesn't have any physical meaning right now. The quantity that is observable, that is measurable, is actually the absolute value of the bracket Psi Psi squared. This is a number. Okay. So in order to uh, find out uh, the allowed wave functions that are solution to this equation and the allowed energies that are solution for these equations, we need to consider each uh, problem separately. And in most problems, what's going to change is the potential energy of this tiny massive object. For example, okay, imagine that, uh, and, and like nanoscopically, this is, this is very common. Nanoscopically, imagine that uh, you have an electron that is strapped into a box that is sort of depicted here. And this box is such that there is no potential, it's empty, there's no potential energy, like potential energy is zero, is zero inside. But outside of this box, the potential energy is infinity, which in practice means that the electron is strapped onto this box. And this is uh, a way to model a very crude model of uh, atoms, uh, electrons being attached to uh, atomic nuclei. It's a model to, to measure electrons that are trapped into materials nanoscopically. So given this potential, our task now is try to find out what are the size, the wave functions that that can exist for an electron under these conditions. And given each wave function, what are their allowed energies? So in this case, our goal then is to plot the wave functions Okay, the, the allowed wave function, say, as a function of the size of the box that I'm telling you, say, has size uh, L. Okay. If you solve this evolution equation for this very particular potential here, here's what you find. You find that the wave functions, psi, psi of x, inside this box, there's an infinite number of them. I'm plotting them, for example, one, two, and three. And you start seeing that those wave functions really here really look like waves, right? In particular, uh, they look like the waves that you would expect if you if you were, for example, if that if you had a um, a um, a rope that was stuck uh, at two sides of a wall, 
and then you vibrated it. So the smallest vibration a wave would be something like this, and then the second with a little bit more energy like this. So you're going, you're increasing the number of half wavelengths. You're increasing the number of of uh, ups and downs in those. Uh, it, 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 like uh, allowed. So for a rope that is hooked to two sides, those are like these, this sort of sequence here up to infinity are the only allowed modes of vibration. For an electron inside a box that it's fully trapped into, it's exactly the same thing. There are only some modes of vibration. If you will, there, there's only some wave functions that are allowed, which again, really look like what you would expect from, from a string, right? From a wave, from a wave in, in a string that is hooked to two sides. And then if you calculate the energy of each one of those modes, okay, for each one of those allowed wave functions, all those wave functions solve for this equation with different energies. The smallest energy is called E1, and it turns out that uh, the, the energies, uh, they, they, they get further and further from each other as you increase the energy here. For example, between the first and the second energy, there's like three units of E1. From the second to the third, there's five, and, and so forth. We're, we're increasing the separation between the energies. And again, what comes out from this equation is that there are only some wave functions that are allowed and some energies that are allowed. We again get back quantization of energy. So uh, the electron could be, for example, in Psi 1 with an energy E1, could be in Psi 2 with an energy 4 times E1. It could be in Psi n with an energy, if you look here in the formula, with an energy uh, that is uh, En, n being uh, an integer number. And, and the, the relationship here is that En uh, is n squared times E1. Most generically, oh, first of all, uh, you cannot see this yet, but one can show that the solutions of the evolution equation, they are orthogonal among themselves. That Psi1 is orthogonal to Psi2, is orthogonal to Psi3, for example. So in the most generic state, the electron can be in a combination or superposition of Psi1, Psi2, Psi3, Psi n, right? With a combination of the energies. It's really funky, but that's exactly what it means. In the most generic state, the electron can be in a combination of those wave functions, which means that at the same time, it is in a combination of each energy state associated with each wave function. This is how we represent this. So for example, in the most generic case, the electron wave function is given by a combination of Psi1, Psi2, Psi n. And because uh, Psi is normalized, the absolute value of A1, A2, A n have to sum up to one. And uh, importantly, the probability that the electron is found, say, in Psi n, for the reasons that we discussed in the previous session, is just absolute value of a n squared, okay? which is the same as we did before here. The probability that the wave function a is in state b is this guy absolute value of this guy here squared, the probability that the wave function A is in state C is the absolute value of this guy here squared. So this is the exact same idea, okay? So 
which is exactly the same as saying the probability that the electron is found in psi n is a n squared, which is exact same as saying the probability that the electron has this energy e n is this guy here. The electron having the energy e n or the electron being in state psi n is exactly the same thing. So the last thing that we can do then is actually try to find or other things of, of physical relevance. For example, right, if the electron is in a quantum state psi 3, like this, this top guy here, the, as a function of x, of, of position between 0 and L, the probability that the electron is found as a function of L is given by psi 3, abs, uh, absolute value of bracket psi 3 psi 3 squared which is plotted here in this middle one. And here's what this means, right? This means that if the electron is in state psi 3, there is zero probability that it's found in this place in the box, zero probability that it's found in this state in the box, and maximum probability that it's either here or here or here. If the electron's in state psi 2, for example, psi 2 squared as a function of x, between 0 and L looks like this. So this means that the electron has zero probability of being found in the middle of the box, which is sort of funky, right? So quantum mechanics is funky. So this is just one way that those things play out. Okay. So another example of the evolution equation for which we mentioned already, a particle trapped in a harmonic potential, which, which means like uh, the same type of potential that underlies, uh, it's like the quantum version of, of a mess hooked up into a spring. And again, in this plot to the left here, you see the potential energy of the particle as a function of position x. So what is the quantum version of that? And we talked a little bit about the quantum version of that, but it turns out that if you have this parabolic potential, the associated wave functions and associated probabilities are depicted here. The allowed energies are quite full. It turns out that in this harmonic potential, in this parabolic potential, the electron, the particle, can only have energies that are, in fact, equidistant among themselves, which was not the case, for example, in the, in the box that we just saw. Right? Importantly, the lowest energy that the electron can have is higher than zero, okay? which is a fully quantum feature. The minimal energy is not zero. And the cool thing that you won't be able to fully understand is the fact, well, right now, because we don't have time, is the fact that um, this plot here to the right, the squared of the wave function, okay, the squared of the absolute value of the wave function, um, to cut a long story short, uh, it's sort of goes into a little bit like you see those those tiny tails here of this wave function squared those tiny tails that go to x's like that that go beyond the, the values delimited by this parabola well it, to cut a long story short i won't fully explain but um class in classical uh mechanics for uh, an oscillating spring, um, there are classical turning points, which is when the, the spring actually pulls the mass in the other direction, right? So, and in those classical turning points are points where the potential energy of the particle is uh, maximum, okay? So uh, basically the, the, the thing stops and then reverts 
direction. So it turns out that uh, in quantum mechanically, there is a probability that the quantum object is found at X positions that are beyond the classical turning points, which is, of course, impossible uh, classically, right? It's as if it went a little bit beyond what the energy allows. But th there is no paradox here because that's uh, another set of rules apply. Okay? So those are just two examples on how to use this evolution equation. So uh, given different potentials that the particle sees, we find the allowed wave functions that the particle can uh, be in and the corresponding usually a quantized allowed energy level. So that's the, the, the sort of idea. There's another part to this evolution equation. It turns out that this, the, the, the part that I showed to you, this guy here, is also equal to the way that it, it, it's also related to how the wave function changes as a function of time. So here we had something that had to do with the position, how the wave function changed as a function of the position, the um, potential as a function of x that the wave function sees. It turns out that this is all related to how the wave function changes as a function of time. So here you can see, you can understand this as delta psi divided by delta t. Okay. If we include this extra thing here, okay? This is like the time dependent form of the evolution equation. One can prove, okay, that the general solution to this, now the wave function depends on x and the time, that the general solution is given by the x dependent part that we solved before times a complex exponential factor, okay, that is this factor E here. It's called complex exponential because in the exponential there is this I, which is the imaginary number, times a factor that has to do with time, which is what we want, times the energy, the energy of that particular psi here. The cool thing about this, which is very counterintuitive, is that if now you take the absolute value of bracket of this psi that depends on x and t squared, okay, it's the same as taking the absolute value of this squared plus the absolute value of this squared, right? Because of how the absolute value of this part that depends on t goes, you can you can show go, go back to, to the complex number slide or or search in the internet. The absolute value of this guy of complex exponentials is one. So that this complex value, this absolute value of, of this complex exponential squared is equal to one. So that this guy that is a, the absolute value of bracket squared of something that is a function of x and t is equal to the bracket absolute value squared of something that only has to do with x, which means that this is independent of time. Here's what this means. This means that if you place a quantum object on a quantum state that is a solution for the evolution equation small psi of x, that quantum object stays there forever. Like it, 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 in the sense that what we can measure about that quantum state, the quantum state stays there forever because this that we could measure is equal to this, which is independent of time. For example, if you have a, a hydrogen 
atom or an atom and you model the electrons orbiting around the nucleus. It turns out that each one of those little orbits correspond to one different psi of x. So this means that, for example, if you put your electron in this orbit here, it should stay there forever, or at least what we can measure about this state, it should stay there forever, because this psi is a solution to the evolution equation, or this part of the evolution equation. So it should stay there forever uh, for all intents that we can measure. However, and that's the first problem, that there's something that is wrong with quantum mechanics as we're teaching it here. If you have, say, hydrogen atoms in nature, we usually only find them with the electrons orbiting the ground state. What I'm saying is that we could, in principle, go in a lab, put an electron into what I'm calling the first excited state, like the, the, the second allowed orbit for this electron in the hydrogen atom, and it, it would stay there forever. But that's really weird because I'm sure that you can have an idea that we never find in nature electrons in the hydrogen atom, like in the excited state, floating around. And this is because the quantum mechanics, and that's what's predicted by what I just told you, that if we put an electron here, it stays there forever. However, this is the version of quantum mechanics that doesn't involve noise. Noise. Uh, in quantum mechanics, as we're going to see next, uh, in next, uh, in, in next question, in next uh, classes, noise is going to mess up with this very simple description of quantum mechanics. In practice, if we put an electron in this place here, where in the absence of noise it would stay forever, there is dissipation process that are actually going to make the atom decay the electron decay to its ground state, to the closest orbit. Okay, So all of this is to say that what we've told you right now cannot even account for very simple phenomena. Okay, So we need to take care of these noisy processes that involve the loss of quantum properties through a phenomenon called decoherence. But uh, again, quantum mechanics says in the absence of noise that if you put an electron here in this wave function that is a solution to the to the evolution equation, it should stay there forever, but it doesn't. So there's something missing with this description. Okay, uh, I have a very little time left, maybe ten more minutes because we started five minutes late. Uh, I would like now. I, I assure you, this is the most hardcore part is gone. I would like to uh, talk talk a little bit more about superposition. So as I have mentioned before, a quantum object can be in a superposition of quantum states, equivalently, say, a superposition of energy. So for example, here, right, uh, one electron orbiting this nucleus can be in both orbits and energies simultaneously. If, and that's all that means. It's simultaneously at those two positions, simultaneously with those two energies. The wave function as a function of x and t would be something that is proportional to psi 0 and something proportional psi 1, orbit 0, orbit 1, times this factor that has to do with the energies. Okay. Oh, sorry. And uh, this electron is said to be in a superposition of quantum states. For example, it's as if you had a um, coin, okay, and this coin can be uh, heads or tails, but you throw it in the air, and as it's spinning in the air, it's both heads and tails. So in this sense, um, it's already an idea of, like, uh, with this picture to the right, I want to, to motivate a little bit why people use quantum mechanical objects um, 
as computational units. There's a field called quantum computing, which is a very, uh, very emerging right now. For example, with a classical bit, everything in your computer is encoded in zero and, and ones. Uh, for example, two different voltages, zero volts and five volts or something like this. And uh, your bit is either here in voltage or here. It's, it's like a on off switch. A quantum bit, on the other hand, I like to think of, of them as like a dimmer switch. You can sort of tune a little bit how much in, in zero uh, the state is, how much in one a state is. And this would be represented by different values of A1 and A0. So just an idea that this would mean that there's like more ways of encoding information. Here, the encoding is binary. Okay, it's on or off. And here, this the encoding is much more analog, you know, like you can sort of tune, but I won't talk anything more about quantum computing. So superposition is something like this. It's a quantum state that is in a combination of different allowed energy states or different allowed wave functions. Now, it's my only pet peeve of this whole week. I am sure you will hear some speakers uh, this week calling superposition, instead of superposition, calling it coherence. Okay? Whenever you hear the word coherence, you can safely assume they mean superposition. People usually do not say superposition of what? Superposition can be in, of many different things. It can be a superposition of orbits, superposition of the position, superposition of spins, where you're going to see what a spin in. Super, for a photon, it can be in a superposition of polarizations. So coherence equals superposition. Ask the speaker to, to qualify the superposition, because otherwise things uh, can get messy really quickly. OK, so there is no need to use the word uh, coherence. Superposition is equal to coherence. And in my ideal world, nobody in this in quantum biology would use the, the word superposition uh, co coherence anymore. Now, related to superposition, I would like to talk about measurement or observation of a single system. And the idea is that even if a quantum object like an electron can be in a superposition of quantum states, when you measure or when you observe it, it turns out that you can only see a classical state and its exact energy. This means that quantum phenomena are hard to observe. Right? This means that if you have an electron in the superposition of orbits and energy states, if you push this atom through something that can measure even either its energy or the electron orbit, you are going to get different things with different probabilities. In particular, with the probability absolute value of A0 squared, as we saw before, we're going to get either the orbit psi 0 and the energy E0, or with the probability A1 squared, you're going to get psi 1 orbit and E1 energy. Okay, So this means that the moment that you measure an object, you get a classical stuff back. Okay. It's, it's um, it, you know, it's the same thing as a biased coin. Well, first of all, it's just like a coin, the coin in space. It's sort of flipping the moment that it, it falls down. It falls down heads or tails. So you actually see either heads or tails. right? And depending if this coin is, is biased, right, it can have 70% probability of turning heads, 30 probabilities of turning tails. So that depending on this probability, if you do many, many trials, you can sort of find out how biased this point is. And for quantum is the same thing. Even if, even though each quantum observation for each quantum system is actually random, it gets chosen with a certain probability. If you want to know about the quantum state before the the, the 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 measurement you need to repeat the measurement many many times you need either to have a bag of atoms that you prepare all in the superposition state or you have to have one same atom that you measure then you prepare and do the same thing so that it's in a superposition again then you measure again right so quantum mechanics is probabilistic 
and uh, you have to do many identical measurements to get statistics on the quantum state. Uh, one last thing that I would like to mention is the fact that um, this collapse to the classical state also uh, involve loss of quantumness that I mentioned is called loss of coherence. Okay, involves decoherence, involves uh, lossy pro processes that are that we haven't talked about too much. As one final note, I would like to talk about entanglement. It's one slide about entanglement um, because um, superposition is uh, the characteristics of one quantum object. Entanglement is the characteristics of two or more quantum objects. Okay. Um, again, already I'll, I'll, I'll parenthesis, I am fairly confident that nature might be using superposition to work. I am not confident yet that nature might be using entanglement to work, close parenthesis, since this is a quantum biology spring school, close parenthesis. So two objects are said to be entangled if you instantaneously learn something about one by learning something about the other. People get freaked out when they say instantaneous because people say, well, nothing travels faster than the speed of light. I assure you that entanglement does not happen faster than the speed of light. Entanglement is also not some weird force or communication weirdness among quantum objects. It's all very uh, well understood mathematically. And uh, in order to, to give an example of what entanglement might be, really like a hand-waving explanation, I would like you to think about, about an experiment with two balls, one which is a green, the other one which is red. Imagine that uh, we meet here in LA when it's sunny and we have two bags. I, I prepared those bags in my home, I put one red ball inside a bag and, and, and the other inside the other bag I put a green ball and then we both meet and then I, I, I tell you pick one of those bags and then you pick one of those bags you take your bag to your home in Brazil and I remain here in uh, LA. Well what happens when you're back in Brazil in your home country and then you decide to open your bag. We're far away, we didn't communicate. It turns out that the moment that you open your bag in Brazil and you see that you got the red, uh, the, the, the green ball, you know instantaneously that the bag, the, the, the ball that I have in my remaining bag is red. Okay. So first of all, uh, you know that instantaneously because you opened your your bag, you know that yours is green, so that mine must be red. So you just learned about my bag by learning about uh, your ball by learning about my, no, you just learned about my ball by learning about your ball. Okay. However, I did not learn anything yet. In order for me to learn about my ball, you have to pick up the classical phone and uh, sort of tell me which color you found so that I will know what color I found. And the fact that you need to pick up the phone to tell me this information is what guarantees that no uh, information travels faster than the speed of light. But this is the idea of entangled, entanglement. You know something about one object by learning something about the other because they are related, because they were prepared in a related way, because everyone knew when they were prepared that was one bag carrying a green ball and one bag preparing a red ball. That's all that entanglement is. So those are some of the concepts you can now qualitatively describe. Okay, there's more to come. Okay, decoherence was mentioned twice today, but that's that's going to come. Uh, I won't have time uh, to talk about that, but there's some really interesting things related to measurement that we talked a little bit about and the coherence. Okay, because everything that starts quantum dies classical. Uh, however, those quantum effects before they die out can have macroscopic consequences, can, can change things big time. And that's one of the ways that uh, quantum is going to play out in biology. Even if quantum things usually happen, are usually described as happening inside 
very controlled conditions, uh, cold temperatures, vacuum states. But we already know that there are quantum things happening in our lives that don't require any of this and that are already powered by quantum mechanics. So those are the quantum concepts you can uh, now qualitative describe I'm looking forward to discussing uh, with with a subset of you uh, in the in the uh, breakout rooms later on thank you and I think I hope Wendy is there is the Wendy there yes but I think you need to make her co-host I try to do that but I cannot. Uh, I don't have the, the option. Awesome. Wendy. Can you hear me now? Yay. Yes. Okay, good. I was kind of panicking. I'm like, <laughs> I'm here. Um, did you want to go straight into the next talk? Do people need a minute? Um, do you want to take questions? How, does, how do you want this to work? Maybe you spend like one minute introducing yourself uh, yourself, and then and then let's go. OK, um, let me see. Uh, let me see if I can get my screen up. Hold on. Oh, the big green button. Sorry, guys. Here we go. All right. Okay. Can everyone see my my slide? Okay, excellent. This is going to work. So I am Wendy Bean. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences um, at uh, Western Michigan University. Um, I have a graduate degree in cell and developmental biology with a concentration in stem cells. Um, my lab personally studies uh, stem cells and regeneration using the planarian flatworm model. Um, and uh, I have been asked to somehow condense my year and a half. We have three semesters of intro bio for our students um, into 90 minutes. So um, I have left off a lot of things that are near and dear to my heart. Um, and so I hope this will not uh, annoy the people who don't see what they want or annoy people who see stuff they already know because we're trying to get everybody. So, uh, welcome to your very introductory um, speed crash course in biology. Um, here we go. Okay, so I sort of wanted to start by um, going over sort of the four main sort of biological theories um, that sort of drive our discipline. Now, these biological theories aren't laws because absolute general generalizations are really rare in biology, um, mostly because of its underlying principles. We do have laws like Mendel's laws of heredity, which I'm not going to talk about. But as I tell my students, because the organisms haven't read the textbook, they don't know the rules. So frequently, um, uh, things don't go the way we want. So we have theories that are substantiated by a large body of evidence, typically hundreds of years or more. Um, and they do incorporate laws from other disciplines disciplines, um, such as the laws of thermodynamics, which I also am not going over, but are very central. So we have four, cell theory, gene theory, the theory of evolution, and the theory of homeostasis, which a lot of people forget is actually a theory. Um, and I just briefly want to go over, I'm not going to talk about all of these today um, in depth or anything in depth, really. Um, but um, sort of the same way that all sciences can be viewed as physics, um, all biology can be viewed as cellular. So any investigation of biology is going to come down to how cells work at some point. Um, and cell theory basically just says three fairly important but simple things. All life is composed of cells, as we know it. Cells are the basic unit 
unit, the functional unit of life and cells arise from other cells. The second theory, um, which is uh, alternatively known as the gene theory or the, or the central dogma, um, sort of explains kind of um, how cells uh, give rise to other cells, really. So it basically says that genes are the basic unit of heredity. This is where we get our inherited traits from. And the central dogma has a lot to do with information flow, where we go from DNA to RNA and protein. And I will talk about more of that later. All right. Third theory is evolution. Um, it is basically the concept of the common ancestor. We aren't all descended from apes, but at some point, however many millions or billions of years ago, we all had an ancestor in common, even with bacteria. And you can see it's not linear in this um, phylogenetic tree, which shows the relationship of the cortex part of the brain, if you're interested in, um, from bony fish all the way up to um, all the vertebrates, people with um, animals with spines. Um, but at some point, even with bacteria, um, there was this wonderful common ancestor named Luca, the last universal common ancestor. Um, and so the theory of evolution basically um, says that we're related and populations change over time and that this change occurs via both mutations, which I'm not going to get today, and natural selection. All right. The last main theory is homeostasis, which is really kind of control theory, um, which says that organisms basically self-regulate to keep a stable internal environment. Um, so the example that we have here is of temperature regulation. You want a pretty kind of cozy zone, I don't know, maybe 72 degrees Fahrenheit, um, 25 Celsius maybe. I don't know how warm you like it. But at some point you get too hot, you start sweating. Um, your body uh, decreases uh, its temperature from the sweat um, and then you cool down. But maybe you keep sweating too much and you get too cold. If you get too cold, you go the other way and you start shivering, in which case that, um, that uh, muscle movement will help um, increase your temperature as it does in newborn babies. Um, so the concept here is really a dynamic equilibrium. So homeostasis is about a system that is prone to changing, uh, which displays no overall change. So small changes that together produce no net change. And the control theory part of it is this sort of feed forward and feedback regulation, which we sort of saw um, with the uh, body temperature, where a stimulus causes some um, effectors, a sensor causes some effectors to um, make something happen that goes back and either inhibits um, uh, or activates again, depending on what it is, um, the stimulus. So the, the final product of the sensor um, goes back and changes the stimulus. So this sort of concept of being able to stably um, uh, regulate a, a certain sort of um, perfect zone or range of conditions that are good for life, um, in cellular life specifically, um, is the basis of homeostasis. All right. Now, this leads to a bunch of what I'm calling core concepts. They are in the intro books a lot of times characterized as a characteristics of life. I have taken a bit of liberties to organize them in a way um, that uh, was more user friendly, hopefully. Um, but the first thing is the concept of adaptation. So all living organisms exhibit a fit to their environment um, and um, biologists refer to this as adaptation, and it's a consequence of evolution uh, by natural selection. Um, so at the end of that process, process of natural selection, organisms are better um, able to exist in their environment. And this is uh, adaptation works at the um, organism level and at the cellular level as well. 
The next thing is something I'm calling structure function. Um, it is very important. Um, I personally, in my lab, call it shape theory. Um, a lot of uh, cell biology comes down to shape, as we'll see. Um, but basically, this states that the basic units of structure um, define the function of all living things. So uh, we're going to talk a bit about structure today. All right, the next one is genetic information flow. So um, <clears throat> this is basically the concept that the growth and behavior of organisms are controlled by information in the genes. So gene expression and hereditary, I mean, um, heredity. All right, the next one is reproduction. But this also, again, is both at the organism level, um, um, but also at the cellular level with cell division. Next, we have metabolism, which really speaks to that homeostasis, trying to keep um, things uh, in the green. Um, but it basically turned basically comes down to energy processing, um, processing and storing of energy. It's a big part of cellular functions. And the last one that I'm going to have here is uh, basically regulation. Um, don't have a lot of time to talk about that today, but it comes down to something that's very, very important for cellular um, uh, uh, life, basically, um, is that uh, you have the ability to both detect and respond to your environment. And again, this is both at the organism level and at the cellular level, which is what we'll mostly talk about today. Now, there are a couple of other things, including uh, order. Um, we like, by life likes to have things in order. Um, and development that we're not going to discuss, which as a developmental biologist really, really hurts, but um, had to let some things go. Um, and we all have to start somewhere. So for us today, it's going to start with self theory and the concept of structure function and with the very building, the basic building blocks of cells, which are known as macromolecule, macromolecules. There are four of them, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and we're going to go over all of them. But before we do that, I want to take a small chemistry break, um, even though there's chemistry sort of all throughout biology, of course. Um, and talk about chemical bonds, because those individual building blocks, um, which, by the way, are known as monomers, a single unit, right, are held together by chemical bonds to form polymers, sort of strings of bonded monomers. Um, and while monomers can be important, by and large, it's the polymers um, that are uh, more often biologically relevant in terms of biology. Um, and the important thing here um, to keep in mind is that chemical bonding um, is very dynamic. There are on and off kinetics. You can see here uh, base pairing uh, between um, two nucleotides. We'll talk about those in a second. Um, but you'll see that they don't just bond and stay. They bond and come off at some rate. Um, some do stay bonded longer than others. Um, but this sort of dynamic part to pretty much everything that we're going to talk about today is a, also a central um, sort of theme of biology. All right, so what about these bonds? What you basically should know, it boils down to there are strong bonds and there are weak bonds. And functionally, we kind of really need both, all right? Strong bonds take a lot of energy to break and a lot of cell biology is figuring out when to break bonds and when to make them, um, as you'll see. Um, and strong bonds are really good for providing structure, right? Because they're, they're, um, they're more solid. Um, the example that we're going to talk about today are covalent bonds, uh, where um, two molecules share electrons, as you see here with carbon and the four hydrogens. Um, sometimes they don't share very equally in the case of oxygen or nitrogen um, and a couple of others. In that case, it's an unequal sharing. Um, and we call this a co 
bipolar covalent bond um, because the unequal pairing, um, the unequal sharing of the electrons creates um, sort of a dipole where some areas are slightly more positive and some areas, in this case, closer to the oxygen are slightly more negative because they spend more time there. And this is going to be important because um, we now want to talk about uh, the consequences of having those polar bonds. So the unequal sharing of electrons leads to weaker hydrogen bonding. So weak bonds uh, uh, obviously take less energy to break. Um, however, if you put many of them together are really, really strong. Um, and this is really useful for remodeling and restructuring, which we will see with DNA um, and some other things um, that being able to make and break bonds very quickly um, is important. So for a hydrogen bond specifically, those parcel, those partial charges from polar molecules attract each other. Um, it's not as strong as like ions being attracted to each other. Um, but basically, in this case, the, the partial positive charge of the hydrogen atoms um, are attracted to the partial negative charge of um, the atom um, that's near the um, other atom that's nearby. So that brings us to our first macromolecule, which is in fact nucleic acids. Um, everything that we're gonna talk about um, with these molecules, I'm gonna tell you what the monomer is, the single unit, and then I'm gonna tell you what the polymers are. And you might have heard more about the polymers than the, than the monomers, uh, the single units, um, but they're all kind of important. Um, so uh, the macromolecule called nucleic acid, uh, its monomer is a nucleotide. Um, you see a picture of it here, and it has um, basically three um, important functional groups, a phosphate group, a sugar, um, and this nitrogenous base. This nitrogenous base um, is the base pairs that you may have heard about in DNA. We'll talk about that more later. Um, suffice it to say, it's the important part of determining your genetic information. Now, the polymers of nucleic acids most people have heard about, in particular, DNA and RNA. DNA houses the genetic code. Uh, RNA actually translates that genetic code so that they can make proteins, sort of like um, needing to translate a book from, from uh, English to German to Portuguese. So you need someone who speaks both English um, and Portuguese. Uh, which would not be me, but hopefully is someone. All right. Um, so examples of um, polymers, we've got DNA, like I just talked about, um, that houses the genetic code, uh, RNA that translates it, right? Um, and I kind of wanted you to note here, that's why I've got this, uh, this uh, video reminding me, that the DNA polymer, so this is the double helix, it's got two strands, um, and the sugars and phosphates form a backbone. I'll more about that in just a second. But those are strong covalent bonds. In between the base pair, those nitrogen bases, these are all hydrogen bonds that are weak, which allows us to do things like you see in this video, where it's being unzipped um, so that it can be copied uh, before um, cell division. Okay, so in case uh, someone out there has not heard of this, um, the base pairs in the DNA in the in the nucleotides um, they pair in a specific um, a specific pattern. Um, there are four main ones that we're going to talk about today. Um, uh, four for DNA, and there's another variant for RNA, which we're not going to talk about. Um, guanine, cytosine, um, adenine, and thymine. Usually, you'll hear those referred to as GCAT. Um, Gs and Cs bind, As and Ts bind. Um, basically, this is a uh, wire diagram view 
of what I just showed you um, before in the cartoon, um, where you've got sort of the latter run of the of the DNA double helix, where the phosphate sugars are the strong backbone, um, and the nitrogenous base stick out from each backbone, um, and they form these weak hydrogen bonds with the closest base that matches it in the other strand. Um, but since there are, as you can see, many, many, many hydrogen bonds together, they're good enough to hold it together. But you can then go in and open up a region if you need to um, copy a part of your genome. All right. Um, some other very important polymers are um, uh, ATP, which actually isn't a monomer. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a monomer. It's not a polymer, which is why I've got it starred there. But it's very important. Um, it is basically where we store our chemical um, energy in in the cell. Uh, much more on that later. Um, and um, another polymer, which is actually a dinucleotide, so it has two together, um, uh, NADH, which is an electron carrier, which is also important um, in um, energy processing. But in this case, it is enabled to take the energy from um, an electron and either store it or donate it. All right. So, um, the functions that we've talked about are housing genetic information, uh, chemical energy, and sort of electron energy. These are the main functions of nucleic acids, though there are a few others. So the next category is carbohydrates, which the monomer is a monosaccharide, meaning one sugar. So carbohydrates are your sugars. So carbs and sugars are the same thing. Um, they don't always tell you that um, on the TV. Um, and you can see over here the, the most important sugar that we're going to talk about today, glucose. It is a monomer. Um, you can see that um, it uh, has this linear form, uh, two ways that the same molecule is shown. The linear form, which is way easier for students, um, and this ring form, which is way more physiologically relevant because this is what the molecule looks like in the cell, which is sort of a water environment. Um, and the one of the main um, functions, especially for glucose, is energy storage. So all of these hydrogen, um, hydrogen uh, carbon covalent bonds store a lot of energy. So glucose is one way where we can sort of um, store energy for long-term use. All right, where ATP is uh, having energy around like a bowl of peanuts ready to eat, right? Um, okay. So um, polymers, um, in addition um, to things like cellulose, uh, which you can um, find in plants, they're a structural fiber. So they can, um, the carbohydrates can play a structural role. Um, they can play a signaling role, sort of like um, if you think about your blood types, your um, A positive or B negative or whatever, um, those are actually determined by sugars or carbohydrates um, that are placed on the outside of the cell. Okay, um, so a signaling role. And um, um, a lot of energy storage. So um, one glucose is not great for storing a bunch of um, a bunch of energy. However, glycogen, which can contain up to thirty thousand glucose monomers, um, um, can store tons of energy. So each one of these little black dots is actually a glycogen structure that looks like this. So each of these granules is one of these. Um, and in cells, uh, carbohydrates, uh, when we say polymers, it generally means uh, two or more. Typically, you don't use it until you at least get three. Um, but uh, polymers and cells of most of these things actually can be thousands of monomers long. Um, and for carbohydrates, certainly often are. All right. Our third category of the day is lipids. 
um, that get uh, quite a bad rap and without which there would not be life as we know it. Um, the monomer is the fatty acid, which is mostly long hydrocarbon chains, as you see here. Um, they are highly hydrophobic. They're insoluble in water, which is good and very important. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, sort of think of that as opposed to carbohydrates or sugars that you put sugar in water, it dissolves right away. Okay. Um, the fatty acid, the monomer, is actually where we get our saturated and unsaturated fats that you hear about, um, where the saturated used to be bad, but now we're finding some saturated fats are actually very healthy and important. All right, so what monomers are we going to make? Um, the most important monomer by far for cellular life is the phospholipid. And um, you can see a diagram of it up here. Um, it is something called an ampipathic molecule, which you do not need to remember the name of. Um, but basically, it means it has one end that people tend to call the head that really likes water, is hydrophilic. And then it's got that fatty acid chains um, on the tail um, that are really hydrophobic in hay water. Right. Um, and this is important because phospholipids, if you put a group of them in an aqueous or water solution like this um, diagram as done here, the tails will try to orient in such a way that they are not exposed to water. So they kind of the tails face each other like we have down here um, and they naturally want to to um, form these ring like structures like you see in this model uh, so that all of the water loving heads are on the outside, um, which we call extracellular now. Um, and um, on the inside face is also the other row of heads and the two tails from this double layer, this phospholipid bilayer, um, face each other, which puts um, you having just, congratulations, made a membrane without which cells would not exist. No cell, I mean, no membrane, no cell, right? We need an us versus them sort of thing. Um, so phosphorly, uh, phospholipids, very important. Um, we also have um, fats. Um, which you might know more as triglycerides, um, especially if you're older and talk to your doctor. Um, and um, they are very uh, good energy stores, um, which is sort of why people have problem putting on weight because Triglycerides are really good energy storage. Um, and then another um, part that unfortunately I just couldn't fit a lot of signaling into this talk, sort of breaks my heart. Um, but um, steroids um, or hormones um, are a lipid um, that play huge signaling roles um, in multicellular organisms that um, signal from cells in one place of the body to a very far away place. Okay, so. Our last macromolecule, and the one we'll probably spend most of the time talking about, is proteins. Our proteins is, I think is. Okay. Um, the monomer for protein um, is the amino acid. I have put in the abbreviation because you might run into that. Um, cellular biologists and lots of biologists, cellular molecular biologists, I guess, um, are prone to just use AA, either capital or lowercase, um, uh, when talking about amino acids. And a bunch of amino acids is eventually going to make a protein. Proteins are super important. They make up about 20% of the human body, of your tissues. Um, so it is a significant investment. Um, the structure of an amino acid is shown here. Um, ignore the red box. That was from this um, nice person uh, who let me uh, download this off of Wikimedia. And um, what basically is it has some functional groups, um, uh, an amino end, a carboxyl end, um, you can remember that or not, but what I want you to remember is this R group, which is also known as the side chain. Um, so basically above this R, every amino acid that we know about looks like this and has this structure. And the only thing that varies is this R group. 
All right. So before we go too far into polymers, um, let's talk about those R groups. There are actually 22 different R groups, 20 that are common and two that are uh, more rare and uh, discovered more recently. Um, they are classified by the functional groups of that R group. So basically what makes each individual of those 22 amino acids different is, is the composition of their R group. All right. Um, and we basically classify them um, by function. So we have hydrophobic amino acids, we have hydrophilic or polar, uh, which is almost sort of the same thing. Um, we have acidic um, or basic um, amino acids. Um, basically, these are just ways to characterize it um, based on the side chain that stick out from the uh, polymer and drive protein folding, which um, we'll just about talk about now and is super important. So what are the polymers for amino acids? Well, it's actually two proteins and something called polypeptides or peptides or oligopeptides. Um, it's nothing like uh, some biology for you. Why have one term um, that you can use pretty definitively when you can have five terms that are used sort of kind of overlapping and we really don't um, have a good rule book for that. But the main difference is, is that a polypeptide is not functional. So what you see up here is two ways to view a polypeptide, this sort of um, uh, beads on a string model uh, where we have got uh, the amino acids, which I kindly forgot to uh, let you know that amino acids have a three letter and a one letter abbreviation. Um, which is important if you ever do sequencing or bioinformatics. Um, but otherwise, never mind. Um, so we can do it sort of at um, this uh, more abstract level, or we can actually do um, the wire diagram of the chemical formulas. Um, the main point here is that they are a polymer composed of amino acids, but they are not functional. Only proteins are functional except when that's not true. So in fact, this polypeptide is actually a neuropeptide, neurotensin, if you care. It's released after you eat to encourage fatty acid take up. So probably something we all kind of want a little less of, at least I do. Um, and it's just a small protein, but it's a peptide. So the nomenclature isn't really used consistently across the subfields or even within the same subfield. But Generally, polypeptides are not functional. Proteins are functional. And for a protein, functionality comes down to shape. Okay. Um, what does it mean to be functional? This is a great question. So uh, when I get to the function, um, which is basically sort of anything you want done in or around the cell, um, functional just means it is able to do its job. Um, and since um, a lot of function requires shape, um, functionality requires folding. So not all proteins that are folded are functional, but all functional proteins are folded, if that makes sense. Um, if you crack an egg um, and, and put it in a skillet, if anyone cooks anymore, or I guess a microwave, for those who don't, um, uh, the egg white, which is sort of translucent, uh, turns white. And that is actually the um, proteins in the egg white um, unfolding, cause the color change and it becomes not functional. Okay, so um, that was an excellent question, by the way. All right, so um, folding is really, really, really important, right? Um, it's critical because the protein's final shape will actually determine its function, not the other way around. Um, um, so I've got a movie here, hopefully. Is it going to go? 
there it goes. Okay. Uh, an example of a polypeptide undergoing folding starts with a wire diagram, overlays it with the one letter abbreviation of the amino acids. It then goes into the beads on a string model, still a polypeptide. Now that polypeptide starts to fold into its sort of origami, its 3D structure. Okay, um, where parts that were very far away are now touching. And so it's going to reverse and show you where those one letter amino acids um, now lie. It'll go back to the wire diagram, which I guess you don't need, but is kind of really cool. And then it's going to do a space filling mo uh, um, model um, to sort of show you more like what it would look like if you had an electron microscope. Um, so that's basically what all proteins need to undergo. So functions. Basically, you need something done, we have a protein for that. Proteins are so important, we're going to concentrate on them for just a moment. Proteins have many, many, many different functions. This is a very short list of just sort of uh, some uh, categories of jobs, not even specific jobs. Um, the first one being proteins um, play a big role in transport. So there are motor proteins that actually move things across the cell. Um, there are channels like you can see here in this image uh, of this transmembrane protein that actually goes through the membrane so that things can pass. Um, uh, proteins are also useful in defense. So when you think about your immune system and the antibodies, those are proteins. Motion. Um, both sort of at the organism level, like your muscles, um, and at the cellular less level, um, proteins are involved in moving things, um, cells or organisms. Here you can see sort of a cartoon of a motor protein that is um, needed for muscle contraction in your cells. And this really, really, really awesome, cool um, photo of the actual protein, it's called myosin, um, doing its job. So this would be its function. Its function is to hinge and that pulls the muscle fibers so that your muscle contracts and then when it lets go, your muscle releases, right? Um, so the muscle, pro the motor protein here is undergoing a conformational or shape change in order to do its job, okay? All right more on shape later. Um, proteins are also important for structure. Um, probably the most common example of a structural protein is collagen. It's found in your bones, your um, skins and the cells, pretty much everywhere. Um, can peptides or proteins be passed between cells or do they only exist inside the cell? Nope, they can definitely be passed between cells and that is the basis of the signaling that I'm not gonna have time to talk about. Maybe we can do a follow-up just on cell signaling. Um, you can tell I'm a cell signaling uh, person, it's, that's my love. All right, so more functions because they just keep coming. Uh, regulation, when we start talking about expressing genes in the genome, uh, those are all proteins. Um, and lastly, we have enzymes, um, which facilitate reactions. And enzymes are super, super important uh, for pretty much most of the things we're gonna talk about later. Um, a catalyst is something that speeds up the rate of a chemical reaction. Um, but it isn't really affected by the reaction itself, okay? Um, um, it's left unchanged at the end. A enzyme, um, which you can see in this little um, in this little animation here, is simply just a catalyst made of protein. Okay, catalysts can be made of other things, but all enzymes are proteins. Um, they have the ability to do lots of things, including couple reactions that need energy with the release of energy from another reaction, um, um, such as the hydrolysis or breaking of ATP. I remember I said that that ATP nucleotide was important for storing energy. If you release the bond, the energy comes out and then you can drive your reaction if you have enough energy. All right. Um, enzymes bind substrates. Substrates um, uh, bind an active site of the enzyme and the substrate 
is changed by the reaction. It basically becomes the, the product of the reaction. And binding specificity from substrate um, enzyme interactions are super specific and it comes down to shape. Um, sort of the lock and key model um, that you sort of see over here where the binding site of the enzyme is only really the right shape to work on the substrates that it was made. Um, it fits in there with non-covalent bonds because you wouldn't want it to be permanent. Um, and then when it's done, it's released. All right. You can, as a helpful tip, recognize most enzymes because their name ends in ACE. And uh, here's an example, kinase. A kinase um, are really critical enzymes that are used in metabolism and signaling. In fact, um, one of the most common ways of activating a protein, like making it functional um, once it's folded, but maybe it can't do its job yet, um, is by adding a phosphate group or inactivating a phosphate group. And that is um, convenient because what kinases do is they are enzymes that add a phosphate, right? So they break a bond from ATP and they um, they add that phosphate um, using some energy from the bond to add the phosphate group to um, its substrate, which case is now a phosphorylated protein. So, right, so this is the process of phosphorylation. Um, there is also dephosphorylation, um, which is the opposite. It's driven by phosphatases, um, which basically uh, removes the phosphate group. The important thing here is that phosphorylation or dephosphorylation causes a protein's shape or conformation to change, sort of seeing here. So if you want to know how phosphorylating something would uh, activate or inactivate a protein by adding it, right, because of those functional groups that are sticking out of the amino acids, um, you uh, often will get a shape change in the protein that will open up a site that means it could do something else. So a lot of proteins can have kinase um, activity, which usually means they have a kinase domain. And since we're on proteins, I want to talk about domains for a second. They are regions of the gene uh, or protein that comprise a functional unit, um, and they have distinct functions. So here are some examples. There are domains that um, control protein-protein interactions, so one protein binding to another. There are domains that allow proteins to bind calcium. There are domains that allow proteins to bind uh, DNA. Um, there's also a domain that's uh, on the end of a lot of proteins that signals it to be transported into the nucleus. So there's lots, hundreds, maybe more, lots, lots more. Um, you can see here, um, you can have more than one domain in a single protein. So this is uh, one long polypeptide chain that's been folded and it has three different domains in the same protein that have been color coded here, um, sort of separated by co um, color. Conversely, any protein that has the same domain is going to have that same function. So here you can see a single domain, this sort of um, uh, Pentagon SH2 um, domain. So this is sort of a, a, a domain scheme that people use a lot. Um, and you can see a bunch of different genes that do different things, but all have green SH2 domains, which means they can all do at least some of the same things, even though they this one is the only one to have this blue one. So it obviously can do something the rest can't. So because of this, you can use domain architecture, meaning which domains it has, right, to help identify a novel protein. So this one here has a bunch of domains, and this one, oops, where did you go? Sorry. Um, has a cat catalytic activity, which to me suggests it's probably an enzyme, if it's even a real one. All right. And furthermore, um, domains are really helpful when investigating evolutionary relationships. So this is a phylogeny or an evolutionary uh, relationship um, of the same gene 
um, homologs in uh, various plants and animals. So a homolog just means they evolved from a common ancestral gene, right? Um, and the different colored regions on the right are comparable domains in each gene. Um, so you can see, here it is, these sort of blue turquoise ones of these three here, they're the only three that have that blue domain. So that probably suggests they are much more closely related to each other than they are to the rest of the genes. All right. So just to give you some brief takeaways, right? Um, because that was like half of one semester or something. I think I need to go faster. Um, is the cell basically equals life. Um, the building blocks that make cells undergo polymerization to make long units. If you arrange those different blocks in different ways, you end up with different functions. Um, and having different types of chemical bonds to arrange those blocks really allows for flexibility and what you want to use them for. And the take home is structure is function. So shape, Win Wendy's personal shape theory. All right. So let's move on to some cell anatomy. Um, cells can have many different shapes. Um, I forgot to throw in a really pretty picture of a neuron here. Uh, the ones you can see here are a schematic um, and an electron uh, microscope image of a skin or epithelial sheet that exist as a sheet that have strong connections um, cell adhesions, connections between each cell, um, sort of like your skin to keep things from going in and like blood and things from coming out. It's quite useful. So <clears throat> cells look different, but pretty much all cells can be divided into three parts. And that if we sort of look inside of it, they kind of decapitated half of this um, cell. Um, first, there's the nucleus that houses all of the genetic information uh, and controls basically uh, information flow, at least at the start. Um, the cytoplasm over here is the stuff between the nucleus here and the membrane. So that includes both the fluid, which is the cytosol, um, cyto just meaning cell, um, and all the structures that are in it that we are gonna talk about in a minute. Um, so anything between the cell membrane and the nucleus is the cytoplasm. Um, the cell membrane, also um, known as the plasma membrane, um, is probably the most important part of the cell because if we don't have a membrane, we don't have a cell. Okay. All right. So cell membrane, I think, is what people are using now. Plasma membrane is what I grew up with. Again, in biology, why have one term when you could have two? But if we want to take a look at the cell membrane, right? Um, it has what people tend to think of as sort of the train track. When you look at it at an electron microscopy, they're super small. They're still arguing about exactly how um, long they are, I think, um, how wide they are. But what you see here is not one phospholipid bilayer, but two phospholipid bilayers. So this is one cell here, and this is one cell over here, a second cell. This is the space in between the cells. Um, and these are the phospholipid bilayer of cell one and phospholipid bilayer of the other. So the hydrophobic tails, making that hydrophobic domain in there um, is that lighter part between the two black runs, okay? So this is only two phospholipid thick, but it does contain a bunch of other proteins, sugars, lipids, um, and to, together the cell membrane not just makes life possible, but it also controls how cells detect and respond to stimuli by controlling what comes in and out of the cell. Now, the membrane is a super busy place. Um, it is very dynamic, by which I mean it undergoes change, something we'll talk about a lot. Um, new proteins are added, um, old or unwanted ones are removed, um, the lipid bilayer is recycled and restored, 
Um, it's not uniform either. The outside or what we're calling extracellular surface um, looks very different than the inside or intracellular surface. Um, and different parts of the cell can have very different membrane components. This provides regional specificity so that it can talk. So in that epithelial sheet that was adhered, adhering to the cells around it, it can send a different communication to one neighbor on its right, and maybe it's not really speaking to the neighbor on its left. Maybe they had a fight. All right, so functions of the cell membrane. Again, this is gonna be kind of uh, busy. Um, it regula uh, regulates cell adhesion, um, which is a very dynamic and changing process, like you can see here in this video, where they have um, cells that are adhered. They add a signaling molecule that causes the that disrupts the cell adhesion. Um, and then once that's uh, washed out, you can see where um, the cell adhesion is reestablished. So um, it responds to signal and then it can regulate itself um, to uh, respond to signal. So um, cell membrane is important in both adhesion and signaling. Um, it's important in sort of identifying self, not self. So the reason that we have um, <clears throat> the reason that we have um, problems with tissue rejection, or uh, one of the reasons anyway, um, when we donate organs is because on the cell membrane uh, are markers um, that um, basically say, hey, I'm me. And so that if something like a bacteria comes in, um, your defense system of the antibodies knows, mm, not you. So I kind of like this model. Um, if you're a purist, um, this is the more chemical model, but they basically come down to the same thing. If you're the right shape that it recognizes you, you're good. If you're the wrong shape, then it's going to be a fight. All right. Transport. This is a huge one. All right. Um, <clears throat> the proteins that are inserted into the membrane, transmembrane proteins, um, control the flow of what's on the outside and what's on the inside. This includes um, amino acids, sugars, um, all sorts of things. Um, it uh, sets up the possibility that there are different conditions inside the cell versus outside the cell, which is an excellent thing if, say, you were a saltwater fish where you really don't want um, all of the water leaving your body um, or vice versa for freshwater fish. All right, so what this means is that in addition of transporting things um, across the membrane, um, that because one of the things that can be transported are ions, this sets up membrane voltage. So um, this is something known as bioelectrical signaling. Uh, the signaling I've been talking about before was biochemical signaling uh, based, of course, in proteins. Um, by and large, um, but um, membrane voltage is something that is the difference between um, the positive and negative charges inside and outside of the cell. We tend to think of this as a thing for like your, your neurons. Um, um, that's how a, a, a nerve cell functions and passes a signal on. Um, is by changing the membrane voltage, <clears throat> typically depolarized, which usually means the inside has more is more positive than the outside. Um, but um, actually, every single cell that is a, um, has a membrane, and so they all have membrane voltage. So you can see here a series of I think these are epithelial cells. Um, that we're looking at the membrane voltage. Um, and here, red and green mean depolarized and blue means not. And you can see that even in a tissue, it is not, um, it is uh, not um, uniform. So what I'm looking for, right? But it can also control membrane voltage at the tissue or organism level. Um, here's a picture of a flatworm. And you can see that this area of the entire worm uh, is depolarized, or this area of the worm uh, is not depolarized. So these things can last for a long time, and they're controlled by the cell membrane. And since we're here, let's talk about gradients, because those are also super important, especially with the signaling that we're not going to get to talk to you about. Um, uh, 
Maybe I should have started with the signaling and giving you all the background later. Um, anyway, if you have the ability to control what goes inside outside so that the inside outside can be different, you have a gradient, right? A concentration gradient um, of say uh, amino acids or sugars or ions or whatever um, is something that is just generally gonna move from high to low. So you sort of think a bike at the end of the hill, you don't really need to pedal the bike, it's gonna go down the hill, okay? So generally uh, things flow from an area that is high into an area of low because they're looking for equilibrium and who isn't. All right, <clears throat> so there are a couple ways that membranes control the gradient um, and the transport across. The first is passive transport, um, which is a spontaneous process. It does not require energy. Um, it is moving with the gradient. So it also is helping to move things from high concentration to low concentration, which means it's a source of kinetic energy, which would be interesting if we had another semester to talk about it. Um, but since we don't, basically passive transport works by two types of diffusion. One, where you just don't really need anything because water, um, like small gases, um, oxygen, carbon dioxide, they can pass through the membrane just fine. They don't need help. Um, and then there's another type of, a second type of diffusion where they actually do need a protein, things that are charged or large, like our uh, ions, you know, those sort of things. Um, those need help to get through that hydrophobic area, um, layer of the um, <clears throat> plasma membrane. Um, and so we have proteins that are inserted that will do that, um, like thus, okay? Um, None of that requires energy. In fact, it can supply energy if you use the gradient, right? Like the physical moving things down the gradient, right? Um, the other type of transport that membranes uh, control is called active transport because it requires energy. <clears throat> typically in the form of, again, breaking or um, hydrolysis of the ATP molecule that's storing our energy. But the important here, important thing here is it's transporting things against the gradient, which is a lot of work. It's like pedaling the bike back up that hill, okay? So we have our gradient, we have this solute, it could be anything, again, ion, sugar, amino acid, just think of something. Um, and it's high on the outside of the cell and it's very low inside the cell, right? But we really still want to make it lower on the inside of the cell. It wants to come in. We don't want it to come in, right? We want to keep the inside low. So we need a transporter protein and some energy to move the solute against the gradient from low to high. All right, that's the starter course on membranes, all right? So let's continue. What else is in the cell, right? So um, we're now going to discuss uh, some of the structures that are part of the cytoplasm, um, which is what the cell membrane surrounds. First, there are ribosomes, which are super, super tiny. There's a dot there, I promise, that you can't see. But um, if you enlarge it with the use of electron microscopy, you can see that ribosomes um, are complexes um, of protein and RNA. So um, basically, those are the templates for making protein. Um, and this whole thing, ribosome, um, is responsible. Well, actually, each individual round thing is a ribosome. They're super tiny. Um, are responsible for making every single protein in the cell. Mitochondria. Yep. Okay. Thought I'd put that in later. So <clears throat> here are mitochondria. Um, they're responsible for producing um, that ATP um, that the we're using around the cell for energy, uh, our bowl of snack nuts um, or pretzels, um, which um, is basically, you know, the center of energy production um, for cells. Um, or processing rather. Anyway, there's also the cytoskeleton, um, which sort of connects everything, okay? It's sort of like a combined skeleton, cellular highway system, uh, signaling center, <clears throat> because apparently everything involves signaling, or at least it, it does when I start thinking about it. <clears throat> anyway, 
There are some other structures that I'm really not going to discuss today. Um, these include things like the ER um, and the Golgi, um, which are part of something called the IMBO membrane system. They're basically a system of membrane bound structures that are based that are like the trafficking and delivery system of the cell. So with the help of these vesicles, which are hollow balls of phospholipid bilayers, um, that can shuttle proteins from one place to the other in the cell. Um, the endomembrane system sort of together sorts proteins for secretion um, or proteins that want to be inserted to membranes or go to other organelles, some organelles. Um, by organelles, I'm really referring to structures in eukaryotic cells that are bound by membranes. Um, eukaryotes, they include plants and animals. They have um, the mitochondria, the nucleus, uh, the ER and Golgi we've been talking about, <clears throat> um, which prokaryotes like bacteria do not. Um, in fact, the nucleus, the mitochondria, and the chloroplasts, which we haven't talked about and are the site of photosynthesis, have double membranes which is kind of interesting. Um, one, it's very important to their function. Uh, here you can see sort of the inner views of uh, mitochondria in animation and some EM um, photos. Um, and they really increase the surface area that the mitochondria have for making ATP. In fact, this inner membrane is thought to really be kind of a, a leftover relic from when in a original long time ago, a bacteria was engulfed by a host eukaryotic cell, and it created this obligate symbiote relationship where neither us or the mitochondria can live apart. We need both of each other. However, mitochondria have their own DNA. Um, it traces through your maternal line. Um, and they can also divide and replicate, um, make more um, on their own without the cell doing it. All right. Um, the mitochondria, which you see here uh, in pink in the diagram, um, are located all throughout the cytoplasm. Um, and while many remain stationary, um, others change position within the cell to where they're needed most. In this really cool video, you can watch as mitochondria, those are sort of the pink purple areas, uh, yellowish purple areas in here of a tumor cell, which is wanting to move a lot, um, move the mitochondria around the, um, the cell, that's the nucleus in, in green, to where the cell needs more ATP. So um, again, it's very dynamic, uh, constantly changing um, environment. All right, not to be confused with the cytoplasm, we have the cytoskeleton, which is a component of the cytoplasm. And it's a network of different protein fibers that again, has many, many functions, all right? Um, it's in control of shell cell shape. Um, sort of, you can sort of see um, the, the fibers here, the sort of the cytoskeleton in red, that nucleus in blue, for some reason, almost all nuclear staining is blue in, in biology. Um, I don't think it has to be, it just is. And you can see here in green, those mitochondria that we were just showing you in that movie in purple. Um, all right, so cell shape and structure, right? So it's giving structure to the cell. Um, it helps uh, transport those vesicles uh, and organelles within the cell. It's required for cell migration and division. It's, it's required for uh, cells to adhere to other cells and its environment, which I also don't have enough time to talk about, which is very interesting. Um, so here we have a, a short little time lapse of the cytoskeleton in a cell. This is actually the nucleus, not a cell. Um, and the cytoskeleton um, is flor uh, tagged with a fluorescent protein. Um, and you can sort of see how those fibers totally cover the nucleus. Um, there are um, three main types of fibers. Um, the two that you probably really kind of want to know the most about um, the, of the cytoskeleton are the microtubules and <clears throat> and actin microfilaments, which I, for some reason, just labeled actin. But you can see here in a much uh, uh, prettier colored um, um, cell, again, nucleus in blue, we have the microtubules in green, right? And then we have sort of the actin network around the edge of the cell, right? 
Um, the important thing to note about the cytoskeleton is that it is constantly remodeling. So this is something called dynamic instability, instability, meaning it has the ability to be able to be formed and taken down really quickly. So basically, we are again talking about monomers, right, um, where the fibers are made through um, into polymers through polymerization and quickly torn down or not quickly, depending on what's needed in depolymerization, uh, depolymerization, and they do this as often as needed. So you can see it sort of here uh, with an actin uh, microfilament. Um, in this uh, in this animation, but cooler, I think, is this. Uh, I think it's a time lapse. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, it's got to be a time lapse um, of some microtubules actually remodeling in a cell, right? So the little places where the arrows are are where it sticks out microtubules and then retracts them because it changes its mind. So why would it change its mind? Well. For one thing, maybe the cell wants to migrate, okay? So here you can see a moving cell. So the whole cell is moving. Um, um, and so cell motility, I guess. Um, these are the changes in actin. So actin has been labeled with a green floor, 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 never mind, fluorescent. There we go. Um, uh, actin, right? Um, so we can see it in green. And what you can see if you watch it for a little while is that the actin polymerizes in the direction, we call that the leading edge, of where the cell wants to go. So the direction the cell wants to go, actin polymerizes there. And in the opposite direction, it depolymerizes to sort of retract itself. And in this way is able to move the whole cell physically from place to place. Now, Cytoskeleton is also super important with moving things around inside the cell. So specifically, um, as you can see in this animation, um, if we are um, trafficking vesicles that were carrying proteins around that we talked about earlier, um, or even like organelles like the mitochondria, with the help of these motor proteins, like I showed you earlier in the talk, um, they move around the cell using this sort of silo cytoskeletal highway, right? Um, Animation is really cool, but I love the bottom picture which is an older but really beautiful um, uh, time lapse. It's um, sped up about twice as fast as really uh, real life. Um, but this is actual vesicles going across to microtubules, just like you saw um, in the animation. But this isn't CGI. These are real cells. All right. So that was the inside of the cell. But that's not the only important part of a cell's life. So the environment outside the cell is almost equally as vital. And um, this, um, in, this environment is, um, is you, okay, let me start over. So there's a huge, large network of proteins called the extracellular matrix. Right, so it's like a mesh network. You can see it here in this picture. This is not the cytoskeleton, and these are cells, right? And this is the extracellular matrix or ECM um, that surround the cell. It gives support and structure to cells and tissues. Um, it is composed of proteins and other sort of macromolecules and such um, that are secreted by the cells, and it's found in all tissues. Um, it helps to segregate, segregate tissues into different parts. And again, because everything comes down to signaling and shape with me, um, I might be biased. Um, it is very important in regulating intracellular communication between um, two cells. That'd be inter. Hmm. May have made a mistake there. Okay. Um, all right. So. What does it look like? Well, as you can see from this diagram in the middle, 
Um, it looks like a mess. It is really a complex place. Um, it is comprised of a lot of things, things that are structural, like the collagen we talked about earlier. They look like sort of rods, like cables or girders uh, in your skyscraper. Um, proteoglycans, proteo for protein, glycan for sugar. So basically, you have a bunch of sugars attached to this protein. Uh, these um, are very important in signaling from from cell to cell, um, even at long distances, and you have things that are important for cell adhesion. So um, in this case, this fibronectin is really important for making sure that the cell is adhered to the extracellular matrix so that it stays in place. Um, there are other cell adhesion molecules as part of the cytoskeleton that control um, cell to cell adhesion. Now, now um, one of the things that we always do, um, let me go back up one here, is we basically usually have a cell and then we have a picture of the extracellular matrix. And what we kind of figure, forget, um, at least I do, um, is that when compared to the cell, your ECM, the extracellular matrix, is way, way larger. OK, um, it has a profound effect. Um, um, it's where the connective tissue is located. Um, you can see a blood vessel going through here. Um, um, it's just a giant area compared to the actual cells themselves. Um, and I snuck this in because I think this is super cool. The extracellular um, environment um, not only um, can transport those actual protein-based uh, signaling cues, um, but cues from the ECM have a profound effect on a wide range of cell behaviors. So the extra cell, what's in the extracellular matrix and the information the cells are getting from it um, can cause cells to, to divide, to move. Um, we didn't even get into any developmental biology about cell fate, so how a cell knows if we all start as one cell, um, as an embryo. How do we end up with thousands um, of cells, uh, many hundreds of thousands, maybe way more, um, that all that many have different functions, right? So that's the process of specification that we're not going to talk about. Um, the ECM can give signals to cause cells to die, to change what cells they're expressing, um, to change who they are attached to. Um, and one really cool one right here um, is mechanocentric input. So the, okay, good, I did turn it off. So the cells moving on the cables and the fibers that are in the extracellular matrix can actually physically signal to another cell, right? So they can signal by um, a mechanical force that can cause faraway cells um, to, to change their activities, which is pretty cool. Um, all right. So more takeaways, more over, overload of information. The cell is a really busy, constantly changing place. Uh, manufacturing and packing are a priority. Uh, it has a very complex sorting and distribution trafficking system. So it's starting to feel a little bit like Amazon here. Um, the cell is exceedingly thrifty. I don't know if you've noticed, but most cellular structures have multiple functions um, and the cell's internal and external environment are both really key. All right, so um, I am now in the world's most fastest speed round, going to go over a series of processes um, uh, or cellular um, act functions, activities, I'm not quite sure what we're doing, um, um, that it would be good for you to know about. And so the first is sort of how, um, moving to gene theory, how the genetic information in the DNA is passed between heredit um, generations. So basically heredity. Yeah, okay. All right, so, um, Let's start with genes. A gene is the basic unit of heredity, right? That's what is passed down from parent to child. There are about roughly, we think, they were still arguing about numbers, 20,000 genes in the human genome, significantly more proteins because there are different ways to make uh, multiple proteins from one gene. 
also not going to talk about those. Um, genes are made up of sequences of DNA, right? Um, they're arranged one after another on specific locations in chromosomes. Chromosomes are a large linear, at least for humans anyway, structural unit of DNA. All right. Um, because we um, are diploid, uh, which means we get one copy of all our chromosomes from the maternal line and one copy from our paternal line, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, which you can see pictured here, nicely falsely colored um, to look pretty, I guess. Um, and that's going to be an important in about two slides. I stuck on here because it's really important to know the difference between a genome and a proteome. So the genome are basically all the DNA that's in a cell, or if you're one celled organism in the organism, but it's at the cell level. Right. A proteome is all the protein in a cell and your DNA in every cell in your body is going to be the same. Right. But the proteins that are expressed in each cell are not going to be the same, even though they all have the same. If why do we have two copies of each if they're identical? Aha. That is an excellent question because they're not identical. And we're going to talk about that in two slides. If you give me a minute. Um, backup copy is a good idea. Um, that works. Okay. <clears throat> First, let's talk about traits. Okay. When we're talking about heredity, what are we talking about? If the, if the gene is a unit of heredity, right, what is being inherited? What we're talking about are traits, which is a characteristic of an organism. It's determined by the gene or environmental factors, but we're not talking about that today. That's a whole nother semester. Um, in this case, uh, the trait that we're going to use in an example is flower color, okay? What you should know here is the difference between genotype and phenotype, right? The genotype, pretty much anything that says genome has to do with DNA, um, genome, um, is the actual DNA sequence of the gene. So the A, G, Cs, and Ts, the base pairs, okay? The phenotype, on the other hand, is the appearance of an organism. So it's the result of the gene expression, okay? So pink, white, and red, et cetera, okay? So the trait is color, right? The DNA sequence tells us what color we'll have, and our phenotype is what we look like on the outside or inside, whatever we're looking at, right? Okay, and so here is where the two um, chromosomes come in, um, okay? So because we have things called alleles, Okay, so we're going to stick with diploid uh, because it's quicker. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, we're not going to go into how they're segregated um, because we don't have time. Sorry. Um, but basically, all right, because we have one copy of each chromosome from our parents. Okay. So say this pink one is from the maternal and this blue one is from the paternal. Wow, that was really gendered. I'm going to change it. The pink one is now the, the male line. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so the male pink, right, see these two are called locuses, which is just a spot on the chromosome where our gene is located, or it could be multiple genes, but we're not going to talk about that. It's, genetics gets really complicated, but an allele are different copies of the same gene. So you, because you have two copies of each chromosome, will have two copies of each gene, okay? If you get the same allele of the gene, so if you think of these colors right here, pink, yellow, green, blue, and red as alleles of the gene for flower color, right? Your dad, the flower, is pink. Your mom, the flower, is blue right? <clears throat> and it will depend on which one you get as to which one you'll have, okay? We do not have time to get into separation. This is a nice possible um, parent genotypes. We'll go over maybe in a second. I'm running kind of late. Um, but anyway, you have, in this case, you could have two pink, two blue, one pink, or blue. Those all you could get. But there are way more different possible alleles, which are versions of the same gene, but result in a different characteristic, like a different phenotype, 
Okay. So the locus is flower color. Okay. You're going to have two alleles, either two different flower colors or two of the same flower colors, but there are way more, in this case, five flower colors, um, and that's what an allele is. Okay, and so hence, this is one of the reasons why we have the backup copy. Um, A, if you don't have the other copy, you're hopefully better than not having it, but also the interaction. So in the case of what if we had yellow and blue? Maybe they would mix and we would end up with the green and we didn't even need a green allele, okay? So because uh, when your um, cells divide uh, for sperm and egg, do not have time to talk about this. This is called meiosis. Um, you get one copy of each chromosome from your parents and it's random whether you get your uh, grand maternal or grand paternal um, copy of the chromosome from your parent, right? So if your parent was, say, uh, had a tall gene and a short gene, right? And your other parent had a tall gene and short gene, that's called um, uh, heterozygous, meaning they have uh, one of each type, so different, right? Um, you could get different combinations. You could be a short child because you got the short gene from both. You could be a tall child, ooh, sorry, because you got the tall gene from both, right? Um, you could even be a homo, uh, heterozygous. So this would be homozygous because it has two of the same alleles. Um, and I think that's probably all the time we have to talk about alleles. Um, if you're super confused, welcome to everybody else who is taking genetics. Um, I love genetics. They're like little word puzzles. Um, but basically, um, many, many different possibilities. You only get two, one from each parent. Uh, and depending on what you get from your maternal and your paternal lines will affect what your phenotype is, your characteristic. Okay, moving on. So we've got all these genes in the chromosome. What are we going to do with them, right? So uh, gene expression is the process of transforming this information that are in these genes into um, all the things that we need, like the proteins that are going to do the work in the cell and eventually end up with the trait, okay? So this is uh, the central dogma, <clears throat> which is um, where we go from DNA uh, which can, gets converted into RNA. So it gets um, sort of transcribed, but with uh, a little mistake, sort of like playing telephone. Um, and then the RNA is actually a translator and can translate it into protein. So um, going from DNA to RNA is transcription. Going from RNA to protein is transcription. Okay, so the central dogma of DNA RNA protein involves transcription and Huh. And transcription. Great. I love it. I, that's translation. This is going to be great, isn't it? There, I did it right here. This will be better. Um, don't have a dyslexic teaching you transcription and translation. All right. <clears throat> so we start with the double helix of the DNA on a chromosome, right? We are in the nucleus, right? So we have the DNA, right? We're going to make RNA. We're going to edit that RNA a bit so that it turns into something called messenger RNA, which just means it's ready to move to the cytoplasm. Okay, so we started in the nucleus where the chromosomes and the DNA is. We make some RNA, we move the RNA into the cytoplasm. <clears throat> in the cytoplasm, it finds a, a ribosome. Um, where the protein is going to be made. So the ribosome is a little factory that can take the mRNA um, as a template and put out the amino acid polypeptides um, that then will be folded and transported to wherever they need to go. So if we look at that in just a teeny bit more detail, not too much, um, what we have is we are starting with double-stranded DNA. You can see here the double helix with our base pairs right? Um, and we make a single strand of RNA, okay? We are going to edit this RNA to make it more stable, to remove some stuff we don't want. This is how we can get multiple genes from, the, I mean, multiple proteins from the same gene. <clears throat> um, not going to talk about that process, right? So then we make a mRNA. 
it gets put into the cytoplasm and gets made into this polypeptide, which is the chain of amino acids. And then once that gets folded, we have our protein. And that, in a nutshell, is a gene expression. All right. So how do we regulate that? Okay. So we're going to switch from the flow of information into the regulation of, inform of information. So what if we don't want certain genes to be turned on? I'm always saying, you know, if, you know, I'm an eye cell, I don't want to accidentally turn on the genes that produce stomach acid. That would be unpleasant, right? Or what if we want to turn some on, right? Like um, I just had some glucose in my system and I, I need to start processing it, okay? Um, so this is where uh, gene, um, reg uh, gene ex regulation of gene um, expression comes in. And gene regulation can pretty much happen anywhere during the process, during transcription, right, in the nucleus of the DNA, while we are making that mature RNA that's able to go to the nucleus, while we're making the protein, and even after we've made the protein. Remember, we could add a phosphate on and activate or inactivate a protein. Well, some proteins' job are to transcribe other proteins. We'll talk about them in a second. So you can actually regulate trans, uh, genes um, after they um, are made into proteins. Okay. Gene regulation basically refers to the processes that change the rates of both transcription and translation for a given gene. Okay. It's not the processes themselves, but it's the things that change how often or how fast those processes happen. All right, here's one quick example, okay? Transcriptional regulation, there are tons of exa um, examples. Um, we're gonna talk about transcription factors, which are those proteins that can regulate transcription. Usually they bind DNA, which means they have a DNA binding domain in their protein, right? Uh, usually also will have a nuclear localization signal, so they'll get to the nucleus, but that's another thing. All right, so there are a couple types of transcription factors. There are activators, which are proteins that are going to make transcription happen or make it happen faster or more often. Uh, and then there are transcriptional repressors that are proteins that are going to inhibit the transcription, okay? Um, so you can pretty much ignore, ignore pretty much all of these um, for reasons we're not going to get into. Every once in a while, you'll randomly make uh, a uh, RNA of any given gene, just sort of mathematically. Uh, but the if you really want to produce enough to to make it worth it, you need the you need the activator transcription factor, uh, and if you want to stop it all together, you need the transcription repressor. So the transcription factor that's a repressor. Okay. Um, what I want you to notice here is that this blue area, darker blue area, is the gene, right? There's a promoter region where all the business that actually does the making the RNA goes, but upstream of that our control elements. And I just want for a second to talk about this because this is a promoter region and it's super important. It's regulatory regions of the DNA where those transcription factors and tons of other uh, cofactors and things sit on the DNA strand and that's how they modify the transcription rates. They can be thousands of base pairs away from the start of the gene transcription, um, and they cause folding events that bring all the machinery to the game by bending, right? So this thing called cis regulatory elements are elements that are located on the same chromosome as the gene that they regulate. Um, that's not as important as to recognize that when people are talking about cis regulatory um, control or element or regulation or whatever, they're talking about these, these things that control the rate of making uh, RNA from the genes. All right. But there's other ways that you can regulate your traits, but without changing your genome. So if I was supposed to, I was wanting to have time for um, for mutations, I didn't get to it. Um, but there's this concept of epistasis, which is the process of changing gene expression without changing the DNA sequence, without the changing the genome. Genome. Um, these mice that you see here are sort of identical twins. Uh, their genomes are the same, but they have different 
phenotypes or outward characteristics because they were fed different diets um, that contained, one contained a lot of methyl, and this caused changes um, in what proteins were expressed that changed the color of the coat and made one put on a lot of weight. All right, so how does that work? Well, the first thing you need to know about is chromatin, right? We have a packing problem. There are about six feet of DNA that has to be folded and packaged into a nucleus that is super, super, super tiny, right? Um, this is a process of compaction so that we can fit it in. It's like three million base pairs or something in each cell. Um, and chromatin is the combination of DNA and proteins. The proteins are histones. We're not going to talk about them much, um, but they make up the chromosomes. So when you're doing the DNA, right, um, it needs to be loose so that we can do get all our machinery in there to transcribe our gene into RNA, right? But uh, when we're not transcribing it or when we're about to divide, we make these chromosomes that are tightly, tightly packed, okay? And the rest of the time, they're sort of intermediate packed, depending. OK, this means that if you can change how the chromosomes are compacted, like make it looser, right, you could drive more. And if you made it um, if you made it tighter, which you can do by putting methyl groups on them. OK, um, if you methylate those chromosomes on the histones, it will actually tighten up. The chromosome so that none of the transcription stuff can get in there. So um, uh, gene expression stops. Okay. You could also do this directly on the DNA. So not even at the chromosome level, but at the gene level, right? At the at the at the individual DNA level. About 5% of all of your DNA is methylated at any given time. Sort of see an, uh, a a um, picture of that here. And any DNA that is methylated is going to not be able to be transcribed. It's going to be inhibited. Okay. So this is methylation is basically an inhibition of gene expression. And it's one way that we can change what genes are expressed without changing uh, the DNA. All right. What about making more cells, right? So there's lots of other ways we want to regulate it. Okay. The big thing here is proliferation. Proliferation is a fancy word. Um, that basically talks about an increase in the number of cells. So we're talking population growth, right? It occurs via cell division, which is uh, called mitosis, okay? Um, so not the sperm and egg division, um, which we're not talking about, but the, the meiosis. So what it does is it goes through a process where it copies all the DNA, um, and then it um, takes the chromosomes that it's copied and pulls them apart. And then it's going to um, put membrane in between of them and poof, you have two cells. So that's basically what we're seeing here um, in this video. I told you earlier that the cytoskeleton was very important for cell division. What you're looking at here are the microtubules that literally pull the, the two copies. Well, I guess there's many, many copies, right? So you had two to begin with. So now there's four, um, right, of each chromosome. And they pull two of each to each side. And then you can sort of see the cell starting in the middle, OK? So um, uh, proliferation is basically the process of um, making more cells. This is highly, 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 highly regulated, OK? Um, the process, uh, basically, there is a, a growth um, oops, sorry, um, a growth uh, stage um, where it's just kind of doing its thing and sort of prepping to divide its DNA, um, um, I mean to um, copy its DNA. So DNA synthesis or making new DNA of the whole genome is called replication, which makes two copies of every chromosome. So you end up with four, right? Um, then you have a phase here that prepares for the actual cell division of mitosis. Then you have a short phase here uh, where you actually do the cell dividing that we just saw in that video. The important part about this is that this is controlled 
highly regulated, controlled by checkpoints. There are checkpoint proteins that literally act as sensors that determine if the cell is ready to divide. Do we have all the stuff we need to duplicate the genome? Yes or no? If no, you're not going to make it. Okay. Once we've done that and we're getting ready for mitosis, do, how, do we have we duplicated the genome correctly? Do we have all the stuff we need to divide? If it's no, then you're not going to. Okay. Um, and interestingly, those kinases that add phosphorylation um, are one of the most important um, groups uh, that control these cell cycle um, checkpoints. All right. So. Um, very quickly on to metabolism and energy processing, which is super important. Um, basically, we're going to lump photosynthesis and cellular respiration in together, and I will show you why. All right. So we have our energy cycle. Probably everyone's pretty familiar about this. Plants through photosynthesis take energy from the sun, right? They have pigments that take the energy right, and then transfer, transform the photon energy into um, energy on electrons, okay, um, and then they convert that into glucose. So basically, photosynthesis is where cells, um, it's not just plants, but it's largely plants, convert light energy into chemical energy, specifically, eventually, glucose, okay, the glucose that we talked about earlier. Now, all cells, including plants and the ones that photosynthesize, also undergo cellular respiration. So you have a bunch of glucose. Great. But glucose is like, I guess, the, the I don't know. I do not have a good analogy, like a big warehouse something system that really needs a lot of uh, repacking. you got to cook the meal first to be able to get to it, right? I guess shelling the nuts for my snack nuts and pretzels. I don't know enough analogies. Um, anyway, cellular respiration basically takes that chemical energy, um, I mean, converts the, the chemical energy into glucose into a way more convenient form, okay? And that's the ATP, the one that really is useful, that requires oxygen and it occurs in the mitochondria. So the photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplast, which we didn't talk about at all, um, and um, the cellular respiration occurs in the mitochondria. The important part is this. They are basically the same process in reverse, okay? If you just put in energy and forget to explain why, right? So, so Plants, if you start down here, will take carbon dioxide and some water and some energy, in this case photons, right? They will end up producing oxygen and glucose, okay? So they take these things and they end up making oxygen as waste, which we need. It's great, right? Um, and glucose. Well, everyone, including the plants, needs to take glucose and make it into something we can use like uh, ATP. So in this case, we take glucose and the oxygen, which is why we need it, and we produce carbon dioxide, some water, and some energy in the form of the chemical bonds in ATP. We make a lot of it because um, we're really efficient at it when we're doing this. I'll show you in just a second, right? So basically they're the opposite, right? So if you just put an arrow in the reverse direction, right? Um, they're basically the flip processes, right? <clears throat> Which is cool because of this, right? So this gets us down to redox biology, okay? Um, redox reactions are um, oxidation and reduction. We call them redox because they always occur at the same time. Um, it, it basically has to do with where electrons are going, okay? So oxidation occurs when a molecule, a molecule gives up an electron to a different one, which means automatically that molecule is reduced or undergoes reduction because it has just gained an electron, okay? So that reduced model is now more negative and the other one now is more positive. But more importantly, we have, if we're in photosynthesis, just put a bunch of photon energy into those electrons, which is why we can take some light energy and make a bunch of chemical energy out of it, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, so what we have here in the mitochondria, so we are looking at the mitochondria, this is the business end of converting the glucose 
into um, ATP. There are like 40 million steps and an equal number of enzymes that make all the intermediate metabolites that if you ever take biochem, they will make you learn. Um, <clears throat> But the important part here for redox biology is that this process, right, of taking the energy from the electrons, which we have, we took the energy from glucose, and then we eventually put it into an electron, and then we took it out of the electron, and then we're going to use that um, electron, right, to help us power a machine that makes ATP, okay? I'm happy to talk to people about how that works, but the important part here is that a side project right here is this thing here, which is O2 minus, which does not have a good electron, okay? Um, this is called superoxide. It is in a pathway where it is reduced into hydrogen peroxide, and that further gets reduced, I mean, um, transformed, not reduced, um, it gets converted into water. What you need to know is that superoxide, super uh, can be very toxic, uh, hydrogen peroxide, still toxic, but slightly less toxic, uh, water, really good, okay? This is where reactive oxygen species come in, okay? Don't really need the extra parentheses, okay? They are molecules, right, that have an unpaired an electron because they have donated it one, right? Um, which, um, yeah, molecules that have an unpaired electron. Okay, sorry. Um, so basically, because it has a free electron that's really looking to pair because electrons are apparently very insecure and need a buddy, um, <coughs> they do a lot of damage, right? Because they can bump into things, okay? Um, the cell has many different ways where these reactive oxygen species or ROS can be produced. They can be produced in chloroplasts with photosynthesis. They can be produced in mitochondria, which is the one we we're just talking about. It's usually superoxide and some hydrogen peroxide. Um, there are things called peroxidomes where people where they try to get rid of um, um, ROS and other things like that. So there are a source there. Um, you can get them from the plasma membrane with uh, proteins like NOx and other things that actually take molecular oxygen, O2, and transform it into superoxide, okay? Uh, why would we do that? Well, because if you look over here, ROS, if you don't have too much of it, is actually a positive driver for signaling. I didn't get to signaling, but this is a basic signaling pathway where you have um, a signaling molecule that then activates downstream genes. Everything that has a K here is a kinase. So if you're wondering why I talked about kinases, it's all over the place. Phosphorylating this uh, um, protein activated it. And then once it gets activated, it's going to phosphorylate this protein, which is a transcription factor which is going to cause it to affect which uh, genes are produced in this cell, right? So ROS is a very important um, <clears throat> signaling molecule. Um, uh, the, um, the, if you have too much of it, it's called oxidative stress, and you can get lots of damage, and you can even go through apoptosis and kill cells. So apoptosis is sort of a a script of programmed reactions that cause cells to die, sort of um, uh, self-suicide to save the multicellular organism. Um, not really a thing in single-celled organisms. Um, and um, so there's a, a fine thing between oxidative stress where you're killing yourself um, and not enough for signaling in a sweet spot in the middle where ROS can be a good um, uh, signaling molecule and cause cells to do activities like migrate, divide, and so on. <clears throat> Because you can't let them get out of control, ROS um, have a bunch of antioxidants, right? Things that are trying to keep um, uh, these reactive molecules from forming and also um, converting them into less harmful things like water, okay? Um, and so this whole healthy system, there exists this state of something called redox homeostasis, where you have just the right amount of um, ROS that are being produced through these redox reactions um, and just enough antioxidants to counter them that you don't have none, but you don't have too much. So redox biology really refers to the study of chemical processes um, involving gaining or losing electrons. All right, I'm going to take two seconds. 
I hope it's okay with everyone because I thought it might be nice for people who don't do biology just to have like two minutes of uh, what we really do, except that's kind of hard and I'll talk about it in a second. Um, first thing you know, it should know is that a lot of by far, um, not everything, but a, a great majority of biological research works on model systems. They can be in silico, meaning all in the computer, <clears throat> like AI or models or um, dealing with genomic data, that sort of thing. Animals um, uh, such as the mouse, the fly, my flatworms, um, roundworms. Um, there are a lot of common animal model systems. Um, microorganisms, bacteria, and yeast are very popular. Um, plants, um, there is a huge uh, number of people who study um, plant biology. Uh, main model system there is Arabidopsis. Um, and then there's also um, a primary cell culture where you get tissues um, from from patients, um, uh, and then there are also uh, cells um, that we have engineered in the in the lab, um, sort of like lab strains. Okay, so basically, all of these animal model systems have different assays, different environments. Some are aquatic, some aren't. They have different conditions. Not all model or not all model organisms can use the same techniques. So if you're trying to apply like something to a biological problem, you need to figure out what model system the people who work on that problem usually work with, and then you can figure out um, how to, um, to adequately give um, support or new equipment or work together, collaborate, that sort of thing. Um, uh, in that same vein, what you should really know is that what a large percentage of biological research is doing is looking for the phenotype. Okay, remember this is an obvious change uh, in characteristics. So we'll do things like cause mutations in genes or or proteins or whatever, right? And we'll see what the phenotype is at the organismal level. We call that morphology. Um, at the genetic level. Um, well, this looks like it's an NC2, but you can do you can do looking at mRNA, you can look at proteins, that sort of thing. And we are sort of doing detective work by either activating or inhibiting or messing around with the gene expression. We can try to figure out what the role or the function of that gene is. The thing that you need to know about working with phenotypes is that there is a penetrance problem. Penetrance refers to the frequency with which and with which a trait. Um, yes, fruit flies are very common to investigate. Are there particular breeds of flies? Yeah, it's largely Drosophila, and there are thousands of species. I think that's right, um, of, of Drosophila. Um, I think that's, it's not the only fly. You never want to make positive statements in biology ever because you'll find an exception. Um, <clears throat> okay, penetrance is the frequency with, uh, within with which a trait or a phenotype is expressed by individuals that have the genotype that's known to be able to cause a trait. So say if I, if I mutate this gene and I wind up with no I, right? If I mutate that gene in 100 flies, I'm probably not going to get 100 eyeless flies, right? I will get a certain number of uh, eyes with fly, um, flies with eyes, like say maybe 20%, and then I'll have 80% penetrance of that phenotype, okay? This is because biological variation is an inescapable part of biology, okay? Variance, it can be defined as the appearance of differences in sort of the magnitude of a response among individuals in the same population for the same sort of uh, mutation or treatment or dose or effect or whatever, okay? And this is largely due to redundancy and the fact that everything is able to adapt, okay? Um, <clears throat> we could talk about that for another semester, okay? Um, another thing you should know is that there are sort of fundamental different ways that people can approach things. The two largest that you see in biology are the very commonly known hypothesis driven, which is what all your grant funders want. Um, and then the one that everyone secretly does on the side, which is discovery driven, which goes, hmm, 
I wonder what happens if we do this, right? Or, hey, I observed that. Let's see if that happens again if I do it, right? <clears throat> or descriptive, where you just sort of wanted to document it and you don't really want to know how it works, which um, almost no one does anymore because you can't get that funded. Um, and it's very hard to get the discovery driven. But there are two different ways, sort of. Discovery dri driven seems to be the the sort of pet projects of people. Um, and you have to do a bit of this before usually we can do the hypothesis one that um, is, is um, fundable. Okay, basically the whole point of all of this is that each subdiscipline of biology has its own type of data that it's used to seeing and that it needs to see to be convinced. So just because in my field, I would want to see X, that doesn't mean someone in a different field would also need X, which is important because this is a very, 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 very short list of all the diff of different subfields of biology. So just saying biology or biological research is such a big umbrella, it's crazy. Anything from the quantum biology that hopefully we're all interested in, uh, plants, um, insects, nerves, alien life. I always wanted to be a xenobiologist, never made it. Um, and they're all going to have the, the questions they like to ask and get answered, the assays they like to work with, the model organs they like to work with. Okay, so after that brain dump, here are the main, main, main takeaways. One, shape controls function. Okay. Signaling, which we didn't even talk about, controls everything. Okay. Control of signaling equals life because if you control the signals, right, you're going to control the function, right? Um, and that's basically how the cellular um, uh, cell processes work. The last thing you should know is that if there is a rule that I've talked about, there are at least 50 exceptions because one, biology is constantly evolving, right? We adapt, right? It's dynamic and reactive. That's that regulation. And it is super redundant and messy, which sounds like a bad thing, but is actually a great thing. Because if it weren't, we would not be robust enough. We would all just suddenly die immediately when something horrible happened and we wouldn't be able to respond. So this redundancy and mess messiness that causes the biological variation and the low penetrances um, are one of the reasons why life is so robust. So um, thank you very much for listening to my very inadequate 90 minutes, missing all my favorite things from biology. I don't know how I missed that. Um, and thank you. I'm going to have some water. Thank you, Angie. I learned a lot. Um, if that's okay with everyone, we are going to take a three minute break and here's what's going to happen in, um, in if, for the next hour, starting at uh, 1030 at 30 past the hour. So we have our six moderators in the room. Uh, we are going to create a, uh, we have created uh, different groups that we're going to be working on uh, this, this week. Uh, the groups are going to be remaining the same from day to day, and the moderators are going to go around. Uh, so um, Abazout, can you please um, post the, uh, the, the list of uh, attendance for each group? And we will meet each group uh, in, I mean, we're, we're going to create the different the, the, the different uh, rooms right now. Wenji, if you have time to, to, to stay, please feel free to, to go between. So yeah, yeah. I had a TA cover my first course. Um, yeah. I ignored my phone from my graduate student who I forgot to told I would not be meeting with while I was giving the talk. And in um, 32 minutes, I have to go teach my next course. So I would love to come and stay, but I'm afraid I have to go. But thank you for letting me be a part. This is fun. I can't wait to uh, go back and listen to the intro to um, quantum mechanics, which I definitely need. Um, and I hope everybody has a great week. Thank you. Bye. Wendy. Bye bye, folks. Uh, folks, stay there. Uh, how do I uh, stop, stop recording?